this microconference um, is about thermal zones hierarchy. Um, so this topic was already addressed uh, last time we discussed, but we don't reach uh, a consensus. We don't agree on, on something. And uh, I wanted to discuss again about that so we can have some progress on how we can represent the thermal zone. So it's not about dealing with all the, the, the thermal zone and taking decision, but just how we can organize that to have a, um, in the, the, the resulting code to be, uh, to be clean. So why do we need to, to make this uh, more order? It's because yesterday if we look at the, the code, we have upstream. I'm not talking about outstream, uh, um, out of three uh, Linux kernel, but just the, the upstream kernel. We have one or two thermal zones defined. And now we have boards coming with more than the, 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 the bigger num biggest number I saw is 21 thermal zones. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of sensors. And we have to deal with all the sensors of the same, then same time and take some decisions. So what we want to do with all these sensors is first we want to, to have some kind of a, a description giving a, a, a topology um, which is, even if it's not perfect, at least it gives us an indication uh, which is close to the, to the, to the reality. Uh, also, by giving this uh, relationship between all, with, with, with uh, an hierarchy, we can also uh, organize the, the thermal zone and detect where are the hotspots. And if there is a relationship between the different nodes and if they can interact uh, with the temperature. Also, by grouping the thermal zone with this hierarchy, we can have one governor using uh, uh, one node while well, beginning to handle all the, the, ascend the, the descendant of this node, um, each node representing a thermal zone, uh, and deal with them. And also, it's a way to represent what we have legacy system where we have spanning sensors. So if we want, if he, if we want to extend the, the current framework, uh, we need to, to create a tree representation. Um, so the, 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 the good thing is it's compatible with the current representation, which is a flat representation. Um, this representation gives us a good indication about the, with the, uh, about the topology. And also, it's a way to give a centralized view to a specific governor. Uh, which had, we, we will be able to, to, to act on all the, node, the nodes uh, belonging to this tree. That means um, for the current framework, we have the thermal zones, and this thermal zone can be without sensors. So we, split the, we, we break this paradigm saying we have a thermal zone, a sensor, and um, also a cooling device assigned to it or a governor. So that means the, this entity is alone and we can add um, a sensor or, or cooling device or a governor, but it's optional. And also we can also give a weight to the, um, to the, the nodes uh, of the thermal zone, seeing how much they contribute. Yes? So, uh, you know, we discussed this many times, but yes. why, are you, why you want to call thermal zone you should call thermal sensor and let zone be, you know. Hey, what, what is a sensor regarding sensor, a set, uh, You know, like thermal zone without sensor, it doesn't make sense, right? Thermal zone is basically a zone with many sensors. Like, you know. No. Because it's, zone is a, you know, like an ACPI if you define, like yes. zone is a part of, like it's a surface, is a zone, mm. right? Yeah. That surface can have five sensors. Yeah, but we keep the relationship um, one to one. That means one thermal zone is one sensor. So, yeah, but that's, that's uh, really so it, not... Uh, I agree, we can, um, we can say, okay, it's a sensor, but yeah. in, this, in this representation, is a thermal zone as one sensor, and we build a tree. So, and, um, and the question, maybe one, one of the primary questions that I have with this approach is, uh, why do you need to represent the topology? I mean, let's step back and go on yes. your problem state. 
uh, statement yeah. first, right? Why do you need to represent the, the topology of sensors here? What, what you're going to do with that information? So uh, if we can have give a weight to the thermal zones, and you, present, you represent um, the, the, the different thermal zones with the, this hierarchy, then you can have a, a representation of how um, the, the different sensors um, are grouped for a single entity like cluster zero, which uh, in turn can be grouped the odd cluster for CPU. Um, let me give an example. No. So let's imagine um, we have one sensor on each course, but we don't have a sensor for the cluster. And we want a way to group them. We can do a virtual sensor also. But the, 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 that's the point. That's why we were saying, if you present those bottom circles as a sensor, and thermal zone has weight of you know, dependency on sensors, you can define individual weights of each sensor, and you can have a virtual sensor at your cluster. Right? Yes, but at the end, we, f we, we end up with a, a hierarchy, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you mean a hierarchy? It's a hierarchy of sensor, like, or it's a hierarchy of thermal hierarchy zones? Of sens hierarchy of sensor and zones. So sensor has, it's like thermal zone can have optional, like as you said before, don't have to have temperature. Don't right. have, sorry? Don't have to have temperature, right? So th thermal zone is a, um, you know, is a combination of sensors. So each sensor will have a definitely have, must have its temperature. And the cluster can be virtual zone. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, the way that he's going is a little bit simpler than what you're proposing. I still don't see why you, I mean, it may depend on what's the policy that you want to build over there, but yeah. if you have a hotspot on class zero and you want to represent that, you can just have a virtual sensor that is a set, I mean, it's based off a set of the sensors that it has here. Um, I mean, it doesn't need to be limited to the sensors that are on the cluster, though. Even if you have like something which represents the hotspot, which is even outside, some I have seen that weird stuff already. Uh, people put like a, a thermistor close to the to the to the chip. Uh, that represents better the, uh, the, the hotspot than the internal one. Um, so, I mean, it's not necessarily uh, that you have to build like a hierarchy to represent the hotspot. I, I still don't see why you want to build in a hierarchical way. I see that, uh, yeah, it does represent how the system is built, mm -hmm. but what you're going to do with it. So now if you want to have a governor dealing with all this sensor, thermal zone, whatever. Because of all this design, the current framework, we have a thermal zone, we have a sensor, we have a governor. By using the thermal zone hierarchy, which is a representation, uh, it's the encapsulation uh, of the sensor. Yeah, today we have a one-on-one -on -one bad representation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is we, we keep the thermal zone uh, which is virtual, and it aggregates thermal zone having one sensor. And that's the example. Uh, for, for example, here. So, so one, one clarifying question for the notes that, that I'm trying to take. Uh, do you mean, uh, do you want to have one sensor, one sensor per zone? Is this what you are proposing? Yes. One sensor per zone, and then uh, have a hierarchy of zones. Yes. That's what you are saying. Okay. Yes. And for example, here, uh, you can have all, all the cores having a sensor, a sensor. And then cluster zero does not have a sensor. But when you read the temperature of cluster zero, it aggregates all the, the temperature of all the, the other. We can, of course, we can create a virtual sensor inside this, this uh, thermal zone, uh, aggregating the sensor of the, the child zone. And the, 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 there are even like drivers that do that already. It, sorry? There, there, is, there is drivers that do that. There are, there, there are drivers do, do, doing that. But if you look at the code, how it's designed, and it's about design, because it's the same. At the end, it's the same. How we represent that. Right. But if, if we look at how oh, oh, the, the thermal zone, the, the, the thermal zone can be built in hierarchy, and when you call get tem thermal zone temperature, it's much more, um, uh, the impact on the code in the core framework is, is, is less, less than 
having a, a virtual sensor and trying to do a get temperature from one sensor to other sensors, to a virtual sensor to other sensor. It's much simpler to write a thermal zone saying when I ask to, to, to get me the temperature, it will ask the, the older child thermal zone temperature and do the aggregation without having a virtual sensor. So, uh, like a comment, if you say that something is easier than something else, it would be good to give an example of, you know, of when it takes place. Like, do you have a specific example in mind? Like when you, when the implementation of a zone may be simpler than an implementation of a virtual sensor? That's, I think it's, it's about code. So, I have a, I have a patch. I yeah, can send a patch, but... Okay, so... So, so right. let me give an example. Like, for example, in your clusters, you have one sensor. Also, you know, like in your case, cluster, like in our case example I give you. Mm -hmm. We have, like, say, a temperature sensor on a CPU. But that temperature sensor also affects, like, a, a surface, skin. So there are, so same sensor will be in cluster 1 and cluster 0 in your, you know, in mm -hmm. your example. Mm -hmm. How so do you, how, so do you have to replicate here or? So suppose one sensor here. Something like that? No. So you have a sensor on cluster zero and sensor on cluster one. Same sensor is uh, used in multiple. In the middle. In the middle. It's, it's the so same. So you would have an arrow also, for also example, on from the cluster, cluster one to it's, two. It's here. No. From cluster one, you would have an arrow from two. cluster one to one of the children of cluster zero. So across. No, no. Cross yes. reference. Sorry. Yeah, yeah from here. Either yes. way. Yes. So, so if you if you represent them as a sensor and then the zone as a formula of sensors, then you can. It's logical. It's right? more logical, yeah. Right. I mean, I think the the you'll, you'll achieve the same purpose. You the 101 representation um, it kind of limits us, right, and yeah. and drives us to do this kind of weird hacks of okay, let's have multiple zones on top of each other. And, but if we split the zone from sensor concept. I think even it makes easier, for example, to, 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 to aggregate or to um, connect with hardware on, for example, if we have a better representation of a, of a sen thermal sensor that's used in, in thermal zone. And you will achieve the same purpose, right? I think we've reached the same, the, the same goal. Yes, yeah, same goal, end. yeah. But yeah. So instead of calling that thermal, thermal zone, zone, you want to call that thermal sen sensors. Yeah, which has only temperature with no thresholds, you know, no, what's the called? Trip points, no trip points. Trip points, limits, and yeah. so on. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so you can have a, you can have a, uh, you know, temperature notification limit, that's fine, but not the, the, the trip points are, is at the uh, zone. So, so basically your suggestion will be to, uh, to define sensors as something that measures temperature and zones that something that applies certain uh, limits or trip points on those, sensors, on those things. On a, on a combination of sensors, yeah. okay. Right. If we take the example of, we have a... And then, then again, I mean, you can plug in a sensor on multiple zones yeah. as well. So like doing spanning sensors. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. No. Sensors are expensive, right? People need mm -hmm. to pay money. The, the virtuals are free. So they can, so that's what they've tried to do. Same sensor, use, re, reuse. So from a... From uh, from the program programming, okay, in, yeah. Uh, the yeah, coding I, 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 in inside I, I, the kernel. Yes. So let's let's imagine you have cluster zero. Cluster zero is aggregating. You have a virtual sensor there, yeah. okay, and then you ask the temperature of this thermal zone. Yeah. It will call. It will call the temperature of the sensor, yeah, which is a virtual sensor, and this virtual sensor. What will what with we. Will it call the, the directly the sensor get temperature callback, or will it call the, the get temperature from the thermal zone? So essentially, uh, my kind of vision at this point would be that you have a zone that has a list of sensors, and then there is a function right. which you have to apply to those sensors to get the temperature. And that function can be you know polynomial or you know of the sensors. So you, the paradigm of having one sensor, one term, thermal zone, you break this, this paradigm. Yeah. You so can it have it. You can still represent. I mean, yeah. you would have like one thermal zone has one 
aggregated value at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the output of that function. Yeah. You, yeah, if you want, you can have one to but one But it's two. not a one, one thermal zone to one sensor anymore. Mm. And how do you represent the physically the, the meaning of the thermal zones, the sensors? Then that's back to my first question. Why do you want to represent that? Conceptually, I find it, uh, it's, it's a better representation. I mean, unless, I mean, yeah, I kind of agree with that. But if you are not solving any problem, why bother? What's the problem that you are solving, right? You have like, you, you, what, in the end <coughs> of the day, what you want to do here is like represent hotspots. Okay. And then take control of so them. If we have if we have a governor, and we want this governor to deal with different thermal zone or different sensors. Right. Then I think then that question becomes a, a, diff, a similar question of uh, how do we aggregate uh, to a governor multiple zones, right? Then I think to get to the point where you want to solve the problems that you, you are proposing here, then we would have like a thermal zone can have aggre aggregation of multiple sensors and a governor should have access to multiple thermal zones. Mm -hmm. Then you don't need the, the, the physical representation of, uh, of, uh, of the hierarchy. Yeah, so, so now you have to apply some coding effect. An example, uh, how do you split that? I mean, you say that you want only the cluster zero to uh, all the CPU to only consume a number of watt. And then you will have to split that. If you don't know how is the hierarchy, how you can split then this power budget in smaller power budget for each zone or sensor if you don't have the hierarchy? No, it's not across the zone. So the power allocator governor, you already have a different one budget with many zones, right? Like yeah, in power, yeah, like CPU, GPU, you're already doing. No, I, I, I agree for that. But then between the CPU, are you split the CPU budget between cluster zero and cluster one, uh, between CPU zero and one up to eight? That's the point. If you don't have the dependency between the CPU sensor to the cluster, how you can split that? I mean, what you have right now, you have three independent thermal zones, which are CPU, graphic, and peripherals, and you split that quite easily. But then if you, go, if you want to go um, one more level below, I mean, for the, all the CPU, how, do you, how can you split the budget between all the CPU? Because maybe one is overheating more than another one. So maybe the power budget can be different. If you don't have the topology, you, don't have any, you can't make any decision like that. I mean, the way that I see this, um, you would have, once again, um, back to your example, right? So you would have like multiple uh, thermal zones, uh, one per cluster. Um, can you, one per cluster. And then you would have like, a, 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 as uh, uh, Shri was saying, right, on the power locator, we have a, the, uh, the power consumption entity that represents uh, the consumption of each, of each uh, zone, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, I don't think you would need to have the aggregation or the contribution of each sensor, but you would need to have the, the, the power consumption for each zone, and then yeah, that's it, like at the level of, of, of the zone. Like in the first order, CPU, graphics, and peripherals, the power requirement was already provided that project, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> at the at the level one, your your whatever your power allocator governor will di divide between CPU graphics and peripherals, and the second level uh, power budget of CPU will be divided among them, right? So there you have you know governor is doing multiple level basically with the hierarchy. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so basically, I think the problem is that the, the hierarchy of, of the sensors doesn't have to re reflect the hierarchy of devices that you want to control. Yeah. That's, that's my point. Uh, and then, so you, uh, you, you basically end up with two hierarchies to represent. Uh, and that, uh, I'm not sure what's the model for a 
applying constraints in the in the, in the in the case that you and the stream of us were were proposing like when the, with the with thermal zones having multiple sensors in them so each zone will also have a list of devices that it controls or something like that each zone will have uh, uh, sensors to which is multiple devices cooling devices are part of uh, different, right? Cooling devices. Yeah, yeah, are yeah. Yes, but they are important too, right? Yeah. So you have to Part represent. So, so each zone, there, the, in each zone, there will be a list of devices to control. Yes. And yes. a list of sensors to read from. Yes. yes. Right. That's Something right. like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which is true now, also, right? With the. Device. I mean, it's not the best. It's not the best representation. I agree. It doesn't reflect the hierarchy of the of the of the hardware. But maybe I'm just failing to see what, what, what will be the benefit. I mean, if you guys are really thinking of having like multiple hierarchies here, and you guys are really using that, like the contribution of each hierarchy up to the top hierarchies. But I mean, at the end of the day, as I said, what you want to do is like you have a hotspot, you want to control that, right? And it's not that you really want to, have a, to control the hotspot, you just you want to split the power budget. And according, I mean, because... No, I mean, yeah, I, that's uh, from the perspective of uh, how you are solving the problem, right? Yeah. But the, the problem statement is you have a hotspot, you want to remove that hotspot from your silicon, right? I'm, I mean, I, that, that I, from, from a thermal management perspective, we, that, we that's what we have got. We can to keep the hotspot, I mean... Right, that's, that's the whole point. I mean, you have to, you have no, to, no, you, know, can, you mean, know, you do your thermal... Uh, simulation, your thermal characterization, yeah. you find where your hotspots are and you do representations of you, as Shirman was saying, you have like sensors who are expensive, then you place sensors around that hotspot to represent them. Yeah. And at that point you already know what's the contribution of those sensors to represent that hotspot. Right? Depending on, on the workload that you are running. I'm not sure to flow what you want to mean. My point is just that having this hierarchy, just that when you have several cooling devices of different way to cool. For example, if you take a cluster of CPU, you can either scale down the frequency of all the CPU, or you can inject idle on only one CPU to get the same power budget. How you make the decision? I mean, at some point, you must know that you have a power budget for this cluster and then decide. Yeah, but the, but one hierarchy is not enough for that. Is so, it? Sorry? One hierarchy is, is not enough for that. Because you need to know what, what, what sensors to contribute to your measurement and what devices you can control. Anyway. Um, I would say that I'm not sure to see why you need it's not enough one hierarchy. Because, because in each thermal zone, you will have some cooling device attached. That's the cooling device represents how you can well, cool it, this thermal zone. Well, well, it depends how, on how you define the thermal zone. But we are okay. running out of oh, time yeah. for this topic, so <laughs> let's just pencil it for the for the buff yeah. uh, uh, slot, and let's just move on to the next one. Yeah, okay. I mean, I agree that we need to move on. This is our standing topic. Yeah. 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 We need to move on. Let's get something. Topics. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in like an order, and then let's, let's go back to this one. Oh, sorry. No. no? Need to? Uh, no. Yes, it is. Working now? Okay, good. Um, I'm Moulton. I work for ARM, and I have a couple of slightly more open-ended problems that I haven't actually done any work on or anything, but uh, the first one we actually started a little bit at OSPM Summit in Pisa, and, and Raphael and, this, uh, and I discussed that it might be a good idea to bring it up in this audience. So. 
the thought we've been having um, with regards to, to thermal and, well, most systems today, when you run stuff on them, they get hot, you can't sustain a high level of performance, you need to scale things back. And I think that applies both to mobile and to laptops and, well, most systems today. You can't just assume that a, uh, that a CPU is something that just runs flat out and you can just put busy loops everywhere and it will just keep running at a high level of performance. So think performance will be capped. Um, is that a problem? Um, it depends on, on, on what you're doing, I think. Um, whoa, let's try this one. So what you effectively have is unpredictable compute bandwidth. And that might be fine for some things, but user space today has no idea that this, this capping is happening. And we have at least one thing in the kernel where we imply a certain level of performance with what user space, or we, we have an, uh, an interface where you can basically request a certain performance level, and that is SCAT deadline. Um, in SCAT deadline, you can request uh, a reservation in terms of compute bandwidth, where you specify a period, a period and, and an amount of compute for, for, for each period, right? And I think the implicit assumption at the moment is that the, well, the period is, is not um, scaled according to how fast you're running, but the, uh, the amount of busy time is assumed to be the busy time at the highest performance level. Am I right, Yuri? Yeah, the best is scaled after, after 15 So, yeah, you're right, but then the uh, runtime, it, it, it is actually scaled considering... Yeah, the sure. So <laughs> if, if, if you book a reservation which gives you 5 milliseconds every 10 and you run at half the speed, it basically means that you would be running all the time, right, at that frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, given that we have systems where the, 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 the budget you have to, to spend on CPUs and, and running at a certain OPP can change at any point in time, is, is it a good idea to have an interface where you can sort of lure the, the, the user space into thinking, oh, I can make this reservation and it's all good and I'm going to get this performance level forever? Is, is that a good idea, or should we start thinking about exposing what level of performance user space can actually expect? Um, I don't know if there are other examples in the kernel where we make, where there are these implicit, um, or well, explicit requirements about how fast, uh, what level of performance you, 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 you'll be getting, but at least for deadline we do have it. I think we have it a little bit with util clamp that Patrick just upstreamed as well. Your, your clamp level does have implications for the OPP you're choosing, but it's not a hard guarantee. I, I think it's, it's, it's slightly worse for SCAT deadline where you might be thinking, oh, I can make this reservation, I'm always going to get this, this performance level. So what do we do with SCAT deadline? Is, is it fine that you make a reservation and then if the system can't deliver it, it will silently just ignore your reservation and you don't get the performance level you need? So, so, so the, there are two things, right? First is notification, whether you are constrained, right? That, that is missing. So first, yeah. of, <coughs> first of all, yeah, like you, you requested, you may not get that performance. So you need to notify, you need to know that you are not getting it. Exactly, and that's not there today. You know, it's not there. We, we have in, you know, we expose it uh, in, uh, we bring it to the kernel, but we never use it, at least in for x86. Yeah, and, and the way you use get deadline today, I mean, you, yeah, you make your really reservation and then you assume that it's, it's, it's there, there forever. Or is, is that just a false assumption? Should, should we just say that get deadline, you have a reservation until it can't be honored? Yeah, longer. once till you get interrupt, you're, <laughs> till you get constrained interrupt, you're done. Yeah. But what happens to get deadline? What happens to get deadline when we cap it, for example, due to thermos? Yeah, uh, currently we don't uh, react to that. Uh, my way of uh, thinking about this is that uh, if you know that you can actually be kept, uh, you shouldn't emit stuff that you know that you cannot guarantee, right? So it's something that uh, happens before. Or if you know that uh, if you can, I mean, uh, 
problem is that, yeah, as you say, when, once you admitted something, then there is this contract going on with user space, and then uh, if you're then you're capped, you're basically not respecting that. So I guess what you can do if you can, you want to actually guarantee performance is to admit less, and with yeah. and with that you can do it. That's that's what I'm getting at. Do do we, do we want do we want to have that? Because at the moment it's it's not clear. I mean. You, the dense deadline user can be tricked into thinking that it is actually a contract with the kernel where it's not today. So should we fix it? So uh, on the one hand, we, we need to reintroduce the um, signal for, for missing deadlines. Okay. Is that back in? Okay, so, so that's at least one hint that stuff has gone to bits. Um, we could add um, information to the signal that says why. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, for, for a variable system like that, um, you can, of course, a priori configure things to not hand out the highest of the high. I mm -hmm. mean, yeah. but of course, if you, put it, if you put your phone in bright sunlight in, the, in your car, it, it, yeah, at some point you have to just say, yeah, <laughs> true. The end. Um, um, so when the thermals really kick in, um, we should probably tell user space about it. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess we can have probably both things. So it also depends on the, how bad it is if you are actually breaking that, this contract with some of your tasks. So if you have a task that you cannot I mean, it has to run always, even when you're capped. Mm -hmm. I think we, for that, you actually need to have, I mean, the, 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 the sustainable cap that must be present before you admit that task to the system. Mm -hmm. So that once, in, what, once it is in, it will always be guaranteed if that's possible. And for the others that can actually maybe be stopped or behave worse when the system is capped, we can have a signal and then the user space can actually uh, so, for example, if you have a video that is uh, yeah, playing back, mm. and when you're capped, you can you know, try to reduce the frame rate or, or anything, but you, you can get the signal back. So, so are you proposing to have sort of two kinds of tasks, ones that requires almost like a hard guarantee saying we will never ever take away your reservation, and then you can allow other tasks to actually oversubscribe the CPU, I mean, go above the sustained level, and then when it can't deliver that anymore, then just notify it and say, well, your reservation is no longer on it. This, this sounds like oom, and we're awfully at that. Yes, but mm. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I, I'd, I'd start by just sending signals uh, when programs run and, and they completely fail, um, mostly due to stuff changing mm. and then let user space figure out what to do. Um, for Android, that should probably be enough and then user space can figure out which task to knock on the head. Um, so we don't yeah. want to try to put in like a bar saying you should not make reservations above, I don't know, well, we 50% of your... We already your have this bar and it's configurable. Well, it's a 95% now, isn't but, it? But you can lower it. True. And it's, it's, it's uh, the administrator. I mean, we as kernel developers have no friggin' clue. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the SOC. But is that entirely true? You do have information in ACPI, for example. Can I the, did, didn't I earlier? Well, it was yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. So if we have to rely on ACPI, it's a sad, sad <laughs> world. <laughs> So saying rely to ACPI is like saying rely on English language. It's basically a communication means. So you, you, what, you, what you are really saying is we can't rely on firmware to provide <coughs> actual information, hmm. which yeah. is very true, I mean, in practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do rely on some information. I mean, if there is firmware. ACPI, we can, of course, use it and set a number. It's just... I, let me say, I am not full of faith that this number will be as useful as it could be. But is it better or worse than nothing? I mean, the default is 95%, which is above your 
turbo no, no. range level on, 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 on most of your parts at Intel. And mm -hmm. on ARM, I think that's probably true for many, at least for the bigger cores, that you can't sustain a 95% uh, uh, So, like, uh, once we are in thermal limits, those guarantees don't hold. None of the guarantees hold. Basically, that's how we LFM, the, the lowest frequency, even that's not guaranteed because we can even have a duty cycle, eight steps inside that. So 800 megahertz divided by eight, mm -hmm. 100 megahertz. So what, what you're saying 100 is, megahertz that, is that, your guarantee. That get that line and things <laughs> like that is completely useless on... Uh, it, 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 I mean, if it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's very not, rare. It's not aware of it. It's, it's not aware of any of those deadlines yeah. and it will prioritize controlling the temperatures, mm -hmm. getting away of the yeah. hot spots, as yeah. I was telling you before. That's, that's, that's how it's actually done today. I mean, if we can maybe have like from thermal, from the thermal subsystem, like, and is it even possible today for the, for the system administrator to actually define, or the, for, from ACPI to define three points where if the thermal subsystem could notify the user space, for example, okay, mm -hmm. we are getting hot, but we are not hammering it yet. I mean, yeah, that's possible. You could do that, but you know, yeah. At, at the end of the day, when, when we get to the point where thermals are a thing, mm -hmm. we need to, to, to reduce the, the performance. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all for changing the 95% in a sensible way if we have sensible information. That's not a problem. Yeah, that's where I'm going. I mean, if, if we have information from firmware, why don't we use that to set a more sensible limit? I, I totally agree that it will be different for different devices. Yeah. and. Each vendor might choose to, to have a different level depending on, on what level of guarantees they need. What do we do in extreme thermal events? That's another story. I mean, if you're at the point where the only thing you can do is to shut down, then you're screwed anyway. Right, uh, right. Just, then everybody screwed up, right? Including yeah. system integrators because they didn't foresee that work. Hmm. True. There's a question here or a comment. So I was wondering, is your assumption here that you've got multiple tasks running SCED deadline or are you a single task scenario? Because you could, you could, you know, if you're hitting that limit, you're going to get like three, three signals if there's a signal there and you're just mm -hmm. going to get confused with all that information. I mean, I don't, I don't know how that's necessarily going to help you other than, you know, the fire alarm that's going off, right? You know, um, so some of it's more about the system's architecture too, understanding your limits and understanding what the predicted behavior of some of these workloads are and how to distribute the workload across the cores. But I, I do agree, it, if, we, if we had meaningful information, then, then people trying to schedule these workloads and meet some deadlines, you know, maybe we could make better choices, right? But I, I, I think that as you start to add more to the workload and consolidate your workload mm -hmm. on your multi-core systems, I think then it's just noise at that point. You've got all these fires going off because nobody's hitting their deadline on that core. And then you've got to, that, that gets back to just understanding what are my priority tasks, right? Yep. And, and, then, and then architecting, maybe setting affinity for specific things, you know. I, I don't know what your use case is, and sometimes the use case will define this. Yeah, but for us, it's getting the information out of the user space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, my worry is that, that if, if you want to architect everything now, you need to know how the platform behaves. Yeah, I mean, I if an end user picks up a dev board or a device no, and, and I, one I of you get deadline and that, then we'd screwed, like right? to We'd like to have meaningful data that we could provide the user space. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I mean, unless you are foreseen to say, uh, play on the gray area where only one core is having like a thermal event, like mm. a real fire alarm. Yeah. Um, and then you want to move your workload out of it so that it can cool off. But I mean, it starts to be a little, slightly bit complicated, but I don't know. Yeah, that's probably not what I had in mind. Of was more after like providing like some level of, of guarantee where if you use get deadline, then you would be stopped before you can actually make a reservation that would you, you would oh, be okay. almost sure wouldn't, wouldn't be met. Well, well mm -hmm. the, the, the thing is, is that let's say you had some information and you've got four tasks running on that core and you thought you had everything precisely managed as far as your deadlines, but all of a sudden the fire alarms go off, right? And so you do have that information to tweak it from 95% to something a little more. Mm. And fire alarms are still going off. Then you used to get the bucket and then throw one of the tasks off and move it to another court. You know, you, 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 yeah, you need more. The thermal is not for the core, I think. It's 
yeah. Well, it, it depends on your time frame. Oh, your doesn't it? Yeah. But I don't know if, if, if it's actually feasible to try to shift, I mean, the hotspot from one core to the next, or the whole thing heats up so fast that it's just a global problem anyway. Yeah, if you have some idle CPUs, I don't know. Yeah, so with, with that line, you of course have the period of the task, and mostly this would be like the 60 hertz of your rendering pipeline or whatever is convenient for your audio pipeline or something like that. Um, is the core thermal versus um, package thermal anywhere near that range of time? I mean, does it make sense to shift to another core in those time frames? Okay. But you can't migrate your task that fast. No. Oh. So you can't do anything about it anyway. And if they're in a VM, then, you know, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so the, if, if we plan to use the knobs that are available to define the, um, the reservation we can use for deadline with that knob that we already have, is not that knob affecting both deadline and RT tasks? So does that mean that if we are under thermal pressure, we have only deadline tasks, we basically kill out also the RT tasks in our system? So, so RT um, doesn't have admission control. No, exactly. RT but is basically a failed scheduling policy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is nothing you can really so, do. So what I'm saying is that if, if you are there, they're going to basically, if you only have then deadline, all the RT won't be scheduled because it's uh, yeah. then throttle when deadline basically finishes doing its work. So yeah, they yeah. are admitted, they will never run. That's so we wonder if it's worth at least to try to distinguish what we can allocate with deadline and what is left for RT still within the sustainable performance capacity. Which goes back to what Martin was proposing. So if we, we have to define if, if a deadline granted capacity that leaves some space for RT, for example, and other stuff under thermal conditions also. So uh, this uh, comes back to a U-clamp, of course, because that's the only uh, thing that RT has mm. to yeah, but uh, yeah, you clamp is not really enforcing anything. It no, has to be not. an extension on, on that eventually. So I, I'd hate to add bandwidth to RT. It's just no. no I guess. Um, well, okay. So there, there are different categories of thermal events, but yeah, in different time frames, and there are such that you can't do anything about it because they it will just happen in a in a matter of microseconds, and then the hardware will decide that you will you will right. get less power and that's it and, and you can't do anything except for getting possibly getting notified about that yeah but for those um the workload should already take that into account I probably mean, those will always happen and then i mean if you have a work that is like four milliseconds long and the event happens on microsecond scale it will always happen and therefore the workload should take this into account anyway because yeah. it's just nothing we can do about it well, well so so the work I, the, there is a difference between a workload and a and a, um, how how the what the kernel allows to to happen because the workload is just you know a bunch of tasks that will run and i and the kernel decides how fast they will run right Sure, and sure. That but is so um, this is for admission control, and, and um, we should allow <coughs> so much work that it is possible. And suppose we um, do a while one loop and, and load the CPU up, and then it throttles down, and then we see we cannot ever load this machine up more than, I don't know, 60%, maybe 40%, depending on the platform. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so there, and there that, that's where we should set our admission control. Mm -hmm. right. 
So the yeah, and that means that the admission the control. Control. Yeah, the admission control should be like tuned to the to, to what's going on, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and and. So then admission control will disallow new tasks, and then the existing tasks, if you put it in the sun or something bad happens, your fan breaks or thermal glue dried up, I don't know. <laughs> Weird stuff happens, I know. Yeah, I mean, I think just to maybe circle back on the same thing that you're saying, um, two aspects here, right? If you're designing uh, your admission control, assuming your maximum CPU frequency or your turbo, mm -hmm you already started doing it wrong, yeah. right? So that, there is that. And the other thing is also that uh, I, I think Peter mentioned is like, um, or maybe saying in a different way is that it's not only about thermals at least, it's not only about the admission control mm -hmm. of a scale deadline, doesn't know about that, right? So if you have, yes, your high priority tasks which had been admit, uh, admitted on, on a scale deadline, and maybe you can even admit more, but if you have like a, a noisy workload which is consuming power, like a Y01 mm -hmm. over there, it's also going to contribute to the thermals. And uh, it will. Right? I mean, it, it has nothing to do with the admission control, maybe, right? It's not part of SCADAT line, it's just like a CFS task. But well, it will produce power, it will, it will heat yeah, the, the Yeah, but its contribution will eventually be reduced to 5%, because if you start capping because of thermal, then in the end it's only your deadline task that will end up running minus the 5% that we have reserved for other stuff. So, so, and the history of the 95, the 95 was set way before we ever did any DVFS smarts. Hmm. Um, the moment we started scaling um, work for SCAD deadline, for DVFS, the whole 95% thing went, went out the window, and this is basically an overlooked thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely okay with changing the 95 to a sensible number, mm -hmm. and even doing it dynamically, um, if, if we have the information. That's just okay, yeah. fair enough. But I don't know, maybe one point is also that, uh, yes, we can do smart stuff here, but in the end of the day, it's also part of the job to design the system that uh, fits on, on your thermals uh, uh, envelope, right? Yeah. So we have one more minute for this topic. So last thoughts, and then we need to... Yeah. I, I agree, but... Defer it to uh, the buff time. Yeah. I, I think I agree with your point, but I still think we can do slightly more than just say it's it's up to the user if we do have a little bit of information to not let people put in deadline tasks that use 90 percent of the cpu uh, capacity so what kind of exact information are looking for like from the thermal subsystem for example or some notification through that or i think well, you can subscribe to notifications, can you? I mean, if, if, if you want to know when, when the system gets, uh, gets hot. Right. You, you uh, already can do that. Yeah. From user space. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe just lower the 95% to something derived from whatever information we have in the firmware table. Basically, the sustained rate. I, yeah. I think there's an ACPI thingy or whatever we yeah. have. Yeah. The, the sustained rate and set it to that. And we can probably find something similar for DT. But if you lower this dynamically, then what do you do with all the tasks which are already subscribed to? It's, it's not dynamic. It's, 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 it's a static table. They get a signal. Oh. <laughs> 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 that's the other, uh, that's a home signal. Or maybe you can also start conservatively. So you would first start with a really low cap mm -hmm. and see if you actually need to increase this if you actually have more task that tries to enter the system, I guess. You can monitor that thing. Right. Okay, good. Uh, I think that's it for this topic. So I have one more topic, uh, which is sort of related. Uh, let me see if I can work this out again. Oh, no, I messed it up, didn't I? I think we're here. Can, can I realign it somehow? Especially when they're not your own. <laughs> right, so this is a little bit related, and it actually came out of the discussion again from, from OSPM Summit in PISA. So 
the way we do thermal management today in Linux is very much focused on what devices do we have and, and how can we control them. And if we're in a, in a thermal situation, we decide a set of caps and we apply them to each device and say, you can't go any faster than this. But reality, when you have a thermal situation, what you really need to do is to you need to lower the amount of work you need to do, lower the amount of compute. You need to reduce it somehow. And one way is just to slow everything down. But what if the, the set of caps that our current device-centric thermal management governor decides is, is not the most optimum one for, for your use case? You could have a use case where there is a task you might want to run really fast because it's, it's absolutely essential for the performance and there are some other tasks you can sacrifice um, that you can't really handle today in the way uh, power management works. So should we consider changing the way we, we look at, at, uh, at thermal management and make it uh, task-centric instead? Because as, as we have it today, um, we don't have any, any information about the, the importance of tasks. We don't know how to best spend the thermal budget. Um, and if we try to do clever things in the scheduler, we might actually make things worse. I mean, we can have task placement trying to escape uh, thermal caps. If you cap one set of CPUs, the scheduler says, oh, these CPUs are not capped as hard, then you move more load over there, and then you have to cap them a moment later. Um, so it doesn't really work that well, I think, for some scenarios. Um, so in an ideal world, if you have a thermal situation, you, you want to lower the amount of compute, but I think the application is better, actually better placed at deciding how to lower the amount of compute rather than kernel firmware stepping in and say, you can't go any faster than this. All your CPUs are capped at this level, your GPU is capped at that level, and, and you just have to live inside those constraints. What, what if you had a workload that knew, I actually want a few CPUs that run really fast, but I'm okay with the other ones being, being capped at very low OPP or can sacrifice my GPU completely. There is, there is no room to do that with the way we currently do power management. Oh, okay, thank you. So, so one thought about this. So we still need the ker the kernel to be the last, like the last boundary, like for you know, because uh, we can we can be nice to applications, but then yeah. when when they still yeah. <laughs> don't, yeah. you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So right. this this is not about just shifting the whole problem up into the application because we can't trust them in the end. This is about enabling the applications to do better if they behave. And I don't think the kernel is going to be the last line of defense no, anyway. You, you have something in firmware. Yeah. So you sort of have a number of layers starting from the bottom where you have firmware, then you have kernel. You might have middleware having an opinion in there, and then at, at the very top you have the, yeah. the application. So these applications don't have deadlines. Hmm. It's done. And is, but these applications don't have deadlines because you're kind of contradicting things here is because if they have a deadline and you want some sort of user space notification mm -hmm. that, hey, I should slow things down, mm -hmm. if the application's aware that it's deadline centric, I guess it could reject that, but you, you Well, the application can choose to ignore whatever yeah, we tell it. Yeah. And, and if that happens, then at some point you, have, you will overstep some boundary yeah. and then the yeah. kernel will step in or the firmware will step in and say, well, you, you, you still exceed the power budget. Now I need to put my <laughs> yeah, now I need to clamp boundaries you. in there. Yeah. But, but this is about trying to enable the application to, to stay away from those boundaries so they actually don't get enforced. Um, so letting the, letting the application itself manage how much compute it's, it's, it's requiring. Um, there are a few examples out there. I, I came across a blog post where some graphics people had worked with a specific phone vendor to try to, to, um, to basically self-adapt the amount of detail you were rendering in, 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 in the graphics engine depending on the thermal pressure. So if you're overheating, they basically adapted the workload to become less by reducing the complexity of what you were rendering and thereby you could stay within the thermal budget but you still had a nice frame rate. Because yeah. for graphic, it re graphics, it, it really sucks if you cap your system so hard that you can't meet 30 or 60 FPS, you, you might be better off only being able to see, I don't know, half a mile ahead instead of one mile in, in, in your render distance or whatever. I'm, I'm not a graphics expert. 
um, for applications like that where you might be interested in, in, in investing into making them self-adapting? Could, could we come up with a way to enable them to do that? I know that in Android, I think they recently introduced an interface where you can get notifications. I think they have four different notifications going from mildly critical up to severe uh, for, uh, for thermal. But as far as I know, it doesn't use, we don't have a standardized kernel interface for user space to subscribe to or read saying what, what is the current thermal situation and what should that interface actually be? Can we come up with a metric that they can use to say how far away am I from, from hitting that boundary where firmware will step in and, and hard cap the frequency? Right, so, so yeah. just like uh, from a graphic side of things, like you're saying, if I'm starting to see some, some I'm dropping you know, I'm dropping frames, then I, I start to, you know, make some adjustments. You and then you have that feedback loop. And yeah. I think what you're looking for is that also that feedback. It's not a one-time thing. It's sort of yeah. like the application makes some adjustments, gets additional feedback somehow. Right, yes. Yeah. And I want to be, enable the application to do the adjustments before you have kernel or firmware kicking in and making hard caps so you actually drop the frames. Well. You could, of course, see that you, you exceed the, 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 uh, the thermal budget if you start to see frames dropping, and then you can start thinking about doing something. But if we told it beforehand that now you're actually approaching the, uh, whatever limit you have in, in terms of thermal, and then do something about it proactively, I think yeah. you could end up so with a better user experience. Just to, to maybe uh, I mentioned that on, on, a, on the other topic is um, the way that a system integrator would do it, it would like create bands on the temperature domain, mm -hmm. right? And have three points uh, defined on, 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 on this temperature domain. Mm -hmm. um, it's very common for people to say, hey, yeah, this, uh, on this band we are, you know, fully okay. And then on the next band we are in a warm zone. And then on the next band we would be on a throttling zone. And then the last band would be okay. At this point, you're screwed, you're gonna be shut down, mm. right? That's a very typical design. Yeah. Um, and uh, the thermal subsystem actually sends notifications to user space when you cross the three points, mm -hmm. when you cross up and down. Um, that would be one way of, uh, of uh, uh, obviously, I mean, out of three, uh, you know, policies that people do, it's a whole different ball game. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's at least how it is recommended today. You don't need to necessarily throttle on all the three points. You can just define three points that are just for notification. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it is somewhat there already, but it's out of tree. No, it's uh, it's there. It's it's not. Yeah, the notifications are it's there. It's probably not not in use by out of tree mm. uh, systems, but yeah, it's it's actually there. So can you get those notifications? They, are they per they are thermal zone or on the thermal zone? Okay. Yeah. So maybe they're there. And you can already, define yeah. those on device tree as well, for example. Yeah. There's no. There's no standardized way of saying what are the, the bands. These are left for the system mm. integrator because some people think, okay, two bands are fine, three bands are fine. Some people, okay, I want to have six bands. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, but that would need to be like defined by the system integrator, right? right. Somehow, like more to, to add more trip points for for yes. kind of for this kind of work. So we, that that would require uh, some input from the, like the firmware people. As, I least. mean, yeah, if you have like something in ACPI, for example, then yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So we, somebody needs to tell us what those, what are the, the, what, the bands. What, 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 what the, yeah, what the bands are, essentially. So, so to better understand, we can define three points already, but we also have support to get signals when we cross three points? To there the user like space, we have yeah. CZFS notification. Okay. CZFS notifies that they are sent out. Okay. If that's enough, that's a whole different story, but yeah. Yeah, that would be easy if it's, if it's already there. Uh, I was thinking, yeah, maybe have some now, in con kernel, continuous signal or something that you could use. If you want to basically create a feedback loop in your application okay. saying, okay, I've got this much spare. Yeah, uh, that's not th there. Thermal, yeah, that's I not mean, there. You, you could almost get there if you define a lot of trip points, I guess, but. It's like a concept of thermal capacity. The yeah. thermal capacity we, we have till crossing the next yeah. three point. Or maybe defining, okay, I'm interested to this specific level. Can you notify me when I'm crossing this level? Some kind of 
programmable interface where the application can actually require to be notified on certain specific uh, three points. Yeah, I think uh, Shrini was at some point was proposing something similar, right? Yeah. The notification for the, another question. <laughs> the dev, dev based notifications to the not, no, the current is very slow. Right. Current mechanism is net link based. Right. And it goes to UDEV and then, you know, it distributes. So it's, so it's a dev based, you know, it created device and just directly get notification that will be faster. On that right? node. Mm -hmm. On that node. I mean, that's, okay. the dev node is not existing. He was proposing yeah. to have that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would that be more uh, helpful? Potentially, yeah. So, so what we did internally, just to mock up things, we basically took the, the power allocator governor, and it has like an error feedback in, in, in the feedback loop it has. And we basically just exposed that to user space and tried to let user space adapt itself based on, based on that information. <laughs> And that works. Yeah, I think you, I think you well. could try to that. The other thing I was thinking about is depends on how many uh, gradients of information that you have. And like was mentioned earlier, a systems integrator or something could actually tune it. And if they're if the gradients are reliable and predictable, mm -hmm. then the applications could be tuned ahead of time that when they hit a certain gradient, then it, the application goes into another into another like a low performance a lower performance mode. Yeah. Question at the far back. These signals work? <laughs> Does it need to be signals, or could it just look like the CPU freak interface, where I've got a, a base temperature and a min and a max that I can deal with, and then then the applications can do whatever they wish at that point? Yeah, I'm not sure if it needs to be signals. I mean, the we probably can't react that fast anyway. I mean, it's frame by frame. So if, if it's just something we could pull or read, yeah, may, maybe, that's, maybe that's sufficient. Yeah, but maybe you don't want to be like reacting frame by frame. You maybe you want to define a specific, you know, notification entry point where you just do the switch from, from the application perspective, yeah. right? So when we cross that, that, uh, that three point then, uh, I would switch to another mode where I would have less of a rendering uh, 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 requirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't need to be frame by frame. You would glitch a little bit when you cross yeah, it, yeah, but, but you'll fix you it wouldn't in, in be a like frames. a frame by frame no. kind of adaptation. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a long throw. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, um. So, but uh, then yeah, we'll need uh, we'll need user space to subscribe to those right. not notification mechanisms, whatever they are. So it will have to either open a dev or yeah. uh, or or you know or listen to listen, listen to, to something, yeah. right? Yeah, they will need to listen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's fair enough. I mean, if it yeah, wants, well, feed, if it wants information, yeah. it needs to <laughs> get get it from 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 somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where are we on time? Out of yeah, time? We, we are we are fine. So we are five minutes ahead of time, actually. Oh, you know, even ten minutes. So we we can we. Are there any any more thoughts on this particular topic, on, or we can just switch over to the next one and then? No, I, I think I that's it. It sounds like we have something. Well, that, I have, that I have we one question yeah. related to this. Last year they were talking about thermal capacity govern and you know, thermal capacity in scheduler. Is that patches upstream or is it like? Um, you should ask uh, my song in the back. Tara, she's still working on that. She's running some tests. She, she has been a bit sidetracked on other activity, but it's ongoing. Uh, we'll make sure that this will go outside in the coming weeks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, at least for this topic, the summary is, yes, there is some CSFS notification going on mm -hmm. that you can already not, uh, subscribe. And you would require the system integrator to define your bands, mm -hmm. but either way, if you have the system integrated, defining your bands, reliable bands, um, you, I think there is still a question uh, to answer is uh, if the CSFS notification is enough or we need a, a dev node, for example, to be, mm. you know, at, at the right time scale that you need. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I'll have a look at that patch and see. It's on the list already. It, your it dev was node a patch, patch you, dev node. 
is your dev node patch series already in the main list? I and think that you were supposed to. Yeah, send yeah it, it. It's there. I'll send the mailing list. Then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's it. More questions? No. Next. I'll let you. Sorry about that Netflix stuff. That was the latest thing when we put it in. <laughs> so. I have a problem, but I don't have a good solution beforehand. <laughs> so, uh, the, so we have a, uh, you know, per core P states in uh, Intel platform for pretty long, but uh, you know, pre previously the power was not a consideration on those platform. I mean, it was okay to, but we have power sensitive platforms now with per core P states. It's, it's great for, you know, power. You know, it's significantly improves the power savings and active power savings. And, but at the, we have some small performance loss with pro, some producer consumer type workloads. And uh, good part, good news is that it's not that bad because our hardware, you know, P algorithms already has built in optimization for that. But uh, there are still some cases where OS hints are required. So the, you know, it's very typical example in this is, you know, one of the thread is continuously pushing data, you know, producing some new data and, you know, trying to ask some consumers threads to do things like, you know, rendering or, you know, audio playback or some type of, that, you know, situations. And in that case, you know, uh, the compared to the, it's nothing to do with, uh, you know, it's any other code, the compared to the older generations, we have some performance loss. Like I, you know, you can sim simply do with sketchbench type workload uh, with sleep option. Like if you look at, uh, you know, the PCPS means the old style and, the, you know, uh, sorry, new style, the per-code p-state and SPD means the, you know, we don't have per-code p-state here. And if you look at the, you know, CPU uh, in the, the case, in the per-code p-state case, case, the, you know, CPU uh, 2, which was, uh, you know, in, in previously was running at much higher frequency because of, you know, the other core is running high. So it also gets a boost because of others. But when you run per core P state, you won't get that boost. You know, it's good for power, obviously, but we don't get that boost. And then you lose some performance. And, and it's a, you know, it's not all workloads. It's very, very isolated workloads, but uh, uh, don't see much impact. But, it's, you know, we still need to solve this thing. <clears throat> so I, then I tried to look at this, you know, the average CFS utilization. So like in this, that example, which I was giving you, the one of the CPU one is basically is fully busy with, uh, you know, full capacity. And the other CPU two is the actual CFS, is, you know, utilization is almost 32, you know, very low because it sleeps most of the time, wakes up, do something, again, dump, you know, dump to some hardware, again, go to sleep. So it doesn't have ever built the utilization enough to, uh, do anything. Uh, and I see that you, you know, um, uh, had the similar problem, but they, it's not same problem, but similar where you have some utilization clamps and other things, right? I think you did some, lot of work uh, on, because it's long sleeping task. But I, you know, it doesn't help because I know it, we cannot really define clamps, you know, it's like x86 system, anybody can run any workload, it's not tuned vertically. So we don't have option. Not, not really. Okay. So we don't there, have. There's a worst case. The worst case is when uh, instead of you've got 99% and 5%, when they're 50 50, then they both run slow. Yeah. <laughs> that is the worst. Yeah. So I, I, I did simple experiment, you know, uh, may not be the great one. But if I know that, like in this case, if the current task, which is basically waking up the, you know, the consumer in this case, and its utilization is, uh, and the current one is like, you know, half of the full CPU capacity, then you just uh, give a, you know, indication uh, to the uh, CPU freak update, you know, to schedule till, 
and current you know because to reduce the impact the sked util governor can totally ignore that signal but like in intel p state case we have mechanism where we can somehow relate between different processors we know that they are related uh, we can tell the hardware that they are related then it will know that let me boost this also at the same time but i don't know how uh, how good is that uh, what's the impact so that's what i have questions what's the uh, what will happen if i put this change in this so uh, you don't want a back and forth like you don't want a cyclic uh, positive feedback loop which is going to keep the frequency high right if one is waking up another and then that's waking it back up i don't i mean it's just a code snippet so i don't know how we implemented it but would that cause both cpus to be stay at a higher frequency because the other one needs you yeah yeah that, is that, that a potential issue that yeah as long as both are related they will be high and that's what we want if they are both are related if two cpus are related so if two cpus are running a workload which are related they need to be high otherwise you know it will cause the power distribution an uneven distribution of the power so if they're okay. sharing a cpu this happens naturally yeah yeah but if they're on separate cpus that's when we run into this yeah So maybe I don't understand the case, but it looks like that if you know the tasks, uh, now with uClub, you should be able to take those tasks and keep the frequency to whatever minimum you define as a clump value. So I need to know the tasks ahead. That's true. I mean, what we do, for example, on Android is the tasks are usually in C groups, and we know that those are the tasks most important right now, so always keep the frequency at this level whenever tasks are runnable. Yeah. Yeah, independent I, from their utilization. Actually, if the utilization is above the clamp value, you follow the utilization. But if they are small tasks, you still keep these uh, yeah. minimum utilization. Yeah, that I understand. The problem is, uh, you know, you tuning need to, somebody yeah. to create. But if I like, if you are using my x86 system, like 10 generation, and you don't know, you know, you, unless you are expert user, you don't really know how to change to C group and you know tie this. He will just run a graphics work, you know, something. Well, th there is a per task API so with, with a C score, but you, you need to know the task. So if so you need what is your Yeah, something which is. I guess the point is ideally the OS can figure it out itself and not force not, every not that, end that, user that, to know, do it. Not every user can. And then is this a, just a. Is this Android a is special workload? because, you know, somebody is tuning for you before. Yeah. Right. Is, is this a server workload or what kind of workload? It's is a it client called? workload. Okay. So, no, no, client, client. I'm wondering if this, in this um, kind of workload, you could identify a sort of waker wakey pattern, and uh, it, it happens that uh, one of those two process, uh, process wakes up the other, so waker wakey. Uh, in that case, shouldn't the scheduler already realize that there is this relationship and uh, put the um, two <coughs> tasks close together, so on the same core? When you describe this problem, uh, I, I would say, it, it, it doesn't the scheduler already solve this? No, because no. it recognized that they're waking each other up and put them on the same core. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this is the case. I'm just no, asking it. It won't happen because the other core is so fully busy. It's running continuously, right? It's occupying full 100 capacity of the CPU. <coughs> it's not. So the, the thing you, you just mentioned is uh, a fine wake up. Wake, uh, and that only works um, for uh, if there's idle time. Um, another question is, so another question I had is in this case, are each of the CPUs running in a completely independent power supply? Yes, yeah. They are? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's a frequency, you can get the power savings by frequency savings, and I've done some analysis on that before, and I was like, this is not worth it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, SPD stands for single power. Ah, power, okay, not P state. So, uh, I, I, you know, I might have missed this earlier on, but um, it, so you mentioned this is actually running slower, but do you have any kind of uh, data to show how much slower this is, the, the total task is running? Because it sounds like it's kind of working as intended uh, based, on, based on my interpretation, because the other. It is working as intended, but the. It's, oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's like. <laughs> I guess what, what um, because no, it, it's it is it is uh, by is this working as designed? I would say. Yeah. But the, it has, it has the uh, 
uh, some disadvantage if you compare with the old, you know, old style with the new style, right? Right. What's the performance? But, I mean, also? you're 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 at one hundred percent on one CPU, guaranteed. The other CPU, you're at five percent, right? So if you run the thing, if you run that that second core faster, then maybe you get down to like two percent. Is that is that is is that? No, thing? no, you 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 won't get because of you know whenever we try to associate tasks, we have overhead to send okay. inform hardware. So that's not going to be hundred you know, equal, but it will be like with it. so based this change. I could all get performance very similar. You will never get similar. Same. Yeah, or the same thing, sharing the same frequency. So it, it looks like you want the two CPU to share the same frequency domain. Yeah. So why don't you? I mean, it's not because they have some dedicated frequency control that you can't have a shared frequency domain. No, between they, the they have dedicated frequency control on each. So hardware does, doesn't know each other. Yeah, but from a software point of view, we already have something like that. No, we, we cannot associate, we cannot tell hardware that they are, you know, we have to tell them they are together. N not from an, an hardware, but uh, in, on the um, ARM platform, okay. we have one frequency co uh, domain for all the CPU, and we are looking, we are selecting the highest utilization of all the CPU in the, f in the frequency domain. So can't you create something similar? Yeah, but looking the at the highest utilization of all these CPU. Yeah, but then I beat, defeat the purpose of per per core P state if I do it. Yeah, it's like it's a very that's what I said initially. It's very isolated case, so it's not a panic situation. Very, uh, you know, we, yeah, it's not it's outliers this issue. Yeah. Not really a mainstream. <laughs> Um, can we repurpose the I.O. way? Cause this, this mm -hmm. So what, what I said, just for the record, this is the exact same problem we have with I.O. way. Um, I.O. way is for block devices. This just happens to be not a block device. But it's the exact same problem. Yes, yes. yes. It is the exact same problem. I just didn't want to, because I.O. way is set by the you know, drivers in the yeah. only thing is. It's so yeah. <laughs> So in this case, you would have the consumer do the IO weight on the supplier? Yeah, but I need to identify consumer. How do I, you know? Yeah, it's, no, it's it a question for Peter. Yeah. So in this case, you would have the consumer do the IO weight on the producer. Is that what you would want? Um, so it's the consumer that is waiting. It's, it's waiting on a device that just happens to not be a block device. Well, it's not, okay. It might be talking to a device, but I think his problem was not that he's okay, waiting on a device, right? He was, in a sense, is waiting on the producer. It's on waiting on Futex, basically, here in this example. We are in Futex and so like, one. Yeah. yeah. So we have to send the IO wake, simulate IO wake. You know, in, like I'm simulating a new you know, remote wake. It's right. basically nothing. So you kind of want to include the producer's utilization in, as part of your utilization so that you kind of run fast, yeah. in a sense. And I'm not sure that's the right thing to do, but that would solve your issue. Yeah, that's why the question is. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, was, I was also thinking of a similar scenario with Chromebooks and how we'd have a scenario where we would have a shared handle and the handle would be open, right? But when the handle was open for, for the display, what would happen is, is the GPU processor would be pegged at that frequency. It was actually a bug because we needed to let go of the handle at the better time. It was a power management issue. But if there's some way, like with IO8 or some other mechanism, they could signal or notify that while this is held, you know, keep it up, right? You wouldn't necessarily need to know specifically that the consumer producer wouldn't have to know whom, who is who, you know. This, this, this kind, kind of resembles the, the, this uh, uh, thing that Jerry was talking about in, uh, yesterday in a scheduler proxy execution problem, right? Pretty much, yeah, it's very similar to that one, because they, this is just you know pretty much like the same problem in different terms. So, so, so with proxy, there is a clear and unambiguous. So, so with proxy, there's a clear and unambiguous um, blocked on relation. Oh yeah, yeah. And and this might not have that. Right, that, that, that's correct. But maybe the, so my point is that maybe um, the, so somebody should know that those two but things are related, right? You said it has some 
Yeah. Few Texas, yes. Yes. So if you with some blocking relation, so maybe there you there, so, so if you use a mute a few text in two threads in an application, that they they obviously are correlated. <laughs> well, no, they are because they use the same lock. <laughs> so there is at least one memory location they want to access. <laughs> yeah, but um, so the futex, you don't know who will wake the futex. Right. The futex is just a wait operation. It's futex wait. And it, it'll sit there until somebody in that address space flips the bit and tells it, hey, wake up now. So you don't know who of the many possible tasks that might be. No, no, but I, my point was that if you, if you are a programmer, user space programmer, and if you put the Fudex in, a, in your code, then you kind of know that your threads are going to be working together. So you, in principle, you could also do something else and say, hey, these two threads are really correlated because X, Y, Z, right? So then you have a multi-threaded program that has a gazillion threads that do absolutely nothing important and two that actually do something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, I kind of had to, the similar issues in the embedded space when you're talking about, say, display pipeline too, where you might have two threads working on it, but if you have double buffering, you don't want to treat them as one combined load because they're not going to really delay each other. And then there are sometimes you're not doing bubble, double buffering, and in which case you do want to consider them as one workload. So just because going by wake or wakey doesn't really give you that information. Um, so if you're, not, if you're single buffered, you want to run both of the CPUs really fast mm -hmm. so that you can meet your needs. But if you're double buffered, you can take your own time. So it's, yeah, it's, so it's pretty complicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, I know that. That's why there is no good solution. So that's, this is the you know, best I could think about, but uh, I know it may impact some of those, uh, I know, mobile work. I guess, I mean, I, would, it be, would it be right to say we yeah. need some amount of input from those two threads, I think, to make useful decisions? Yeah, but, you know, then somebody. Yeah, it's not forthcoming. Doesn't, <laughs> have to be, it doesn't have to be tuning or util clamping on a per app or yeah, thread basis, not, but. Yeah. That's not going to happen in Forex, you know. Okay, so if you know, if you have better suggestion, you know, let me know. Or I'll, I'll just send as you know, patch, you can just do it as a record and just maybe comment and leave it if better solution you can suggest. Just one more um, consideration. So if you can identify the tasks from user space, so without changing the application, but you can still have some kind of monitoring mechanism to identify those uh, uh, misbehaviors, then using the per task API, you can still set the attributes. Yeah, yes, if I have a user space which is smart enough to identify the relationship, yeah, we can do that. Yes. Without changing the application, I mean. Yeah, without changing the application. Question uh, Which uh, uh, Intel uh, generation <coughs> has this per core uh, capability? Normax, Xeon, like Skylake, Broadwell, do they have it? Yes. Yes. Okay, so it's not like a latest. No. I mean, it was a while. Okay. Yeah. So, in order to reproduce, when you will send that if it's something that yeah, we don't yeah, have yeah, the other you, core? You need 10th generation. No, you probably. Uh, what do I need? Yeah, 10th generation core. Yeah. So for the client, it is like what the, I the latest one, Ice Lake. Yeah. So yeah. for in the client, in the client space, you need the latest. But you can you can reproduce uh, this on the servers. Yeah. In any yeah. of the servers. Yeah. 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 Just run schedule the uh, sched bench with yeah. sleep. Sure. You'll see it. Yeah. And it's just that the ranges get bigger every. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Sure. Can you say again? Can Can you say again what you do in case? Uh, your governor receives a shared CPU freak wake remote. Oh, I, I, I we have a, uh, we have a boost. It's we, we have a boost. We know that okay. we just increase the. We have something called EPP knob, which or, or the minimum frequency. We can just increase it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it it will. The, the knob is expensive, right? In Ice Lake, not. Yeah, it's not that expensive. It takes hundred cycles, not. Right. Yeah, they are sure. Yeah, as, as long as we don't have to wait. Yeah, no, we don't yeah. wait. Yeah. Okay. Any, so I, I'll yeah, I've commented, let's test it, and if you, yeah.
if you have, I'm sure there are better approaches. And one approach is I was thinking about doing in user space, write some smart app and, you know, <laughs> which identify this relationship, but it's not that, uh, it's not immediate. It's not. Is not, not, not easy. Not easy because that has to be very smart. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No question. Uh, can I get one? So we we are we are pretty much in a break time for yeah for the official break. So uh, let's just do a break and then we 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 will resume after it. Hi, I'm Sudeep from Linux kernel team at ARM. So today I'm going to talk about uh, device power management based on platform firmware. It's not just device, it could be anything in the system. So basically the idea is using platform firmware instead of driving everything from OS. Uh, lots of people are not uh, happy with that idea. Everybody wants this control. so do it has been controversial topic, but there are use cases and requirements that you just can't address having everything, all the control in Linux. So, uh, so the idea here is ARM is trying to standardize the interface and it has achieved to some extent and uh, like this is mostly getting used on quite complex systems like the high-end mobile phones you would see, which has a dedicated controller to do all the power management on your system, and every um, vendor trying to invent their own way to talk to this controller. So this interface is about standardizing that, and we did start initially standardizing everything just to keep the changes minimal the way we approach the solution is like, okay, we have device, it needs some power domain, some performance domain or reset domain, clock domains, just hook them and uh, the sharing information is today given through the device tree. So you need to know for a device X, what domain, power domain it's attached to, say uh, domain Z, power, uh, performance domain Y, so all this information is needed. So we are just thinking about how we can move to uh, st like making it device centric and see like it's most likely the way ACPI works today. Like it's all device centric. Turn on the device, set to the state. It doesn't bother about what domains or where it is in the system. So the approach is more like that. So just to give a background on what most of the embedded, uh, embedded systems had in the past. This shows how everything is in the operating system, trying to deal with all the clocks, reset, power domains, everything in the OS. So now it's migrating to this with uh, some standard interface, talking a standard protocol over anything can be the transport, but you have a dedicated controller that talks. But you need not have a dedicated controller on your system. It could be just a service which is running somewhere remotely. It could be as a secure service on your uh, uh, like application processor itself. It's just abstracted and moved away uh, so that the operating system need not know all those details about where, which register to poke and how to change for each and everything. If you're saying uh, that it could just be a service running either in trusted side or some other coprocessor, um, and then you're also trying to standardize the protocol, wouldn't it be just simpler to just have a standardized ops and let them implement it? Like, what is the benefit of doing this? Yeah. Like, th there's already an abstraction layer by allowing people to implement ops, and drivers can plug in and yes. implement ops. So, I agree. I just gave that as the initial motivation with which we started this. Okay. But the requirements, as more and more requirements come, so we see the real need. So just to get into the next requirement, so how would you do if you had 
two virtual machines, one probably running some other OS and one running Linux. So do you go and implement custom interfaces in each of those and try to solve the problem or just have this standard interface and each uh, virtual machines talk over the same interface. So, so this is becoming increasingly like high uh, requirement even in uh, mobile platforms. People want to run in the virtualized environment, isolating the uh, like partitioning the system and giving uh, some parts isolated to a virtual machine and it deals with all the controls and power management or what not for that part of the stuff. So that's one of like another motivation why we need this uh, more than ever. So what we have today is, as I said, like when we started initially, it was all like just keep the changes minimal. Let's just hook into existing frameworks we have in kernel. Like we have DVFS for performance, reset, clock, power domains, sensors, HWMON, all those things. So it's all fine. It hooks up perfectly well and it's all fine. But as I said, one of the motivation for this is also the virtualized environment. Do we want the virtual machine configuration manager to have each of these information? Like it has to know which clock domain it belongs to, reset, so on and so. So the idea is can we make everything device centric? We just say set this device to something and all the arbitration happens in the uh, platform firmware and also we ha have uh, with this interface as we are dealing with virtual machines like the device isolation and giving permission for each of these uh, devices and the controls they can have with this. So as I was telling, uh, so this is a use case where we have these two resources here can be one of these power clock. So we are just saying this is one VM which is isolated on its own. It talks over this transport and controls this. Whereas another virtual machine can be having and your main virtual machine, ma uh, the manager can control what each of those domain can actually have control over. So the permissions and are all set here. So that's the idea. But again, like if we have to describe the entire uh, topology, like what clock, what power, what uh, performance, that is not going to scale because there is also requirement say that I have to change Don't you need to describe that somewhere anyway? I mean, yeah, the idea, what I'm trying to say is like, do we need that or do we let platform deal with it? Because that's never going to end. As I was about to say, like GPIO, pin mux. So for this device to work, I have to do all these and we keep increasing this uh, controls. So, so basically, basically you are saying that, uh, that a, it could, in principle, be done in the OS, but they, but that could, but that would need that that would require, require more and more complicated code in, you know, going forward, and which may not be scalable enough, and then it it it, it will be hard to address the case in which different OSs run in different VMs and and have to control the same yeah, resources, guess, right? Yeah, it may be possible, but not always true. So because of, as I said, like they want to isolate the system. So yeah, it, it's possible, but if there is another VM running and it's sharing, if you have Linux running, taking control over all, that's just like stepping on each other. So yeah, you could probably do, but we want it to be isolated and uh, put uh, left complete, uh, to the platform to solve this for you because you just don't know what other domains are actually running or VMs are running and 
what they are managing. So one thing I see here, like I, I understand the value of what you're bringing forward. Um, on the flip side, it pushes the complexity down into the firmware. Um, and I fear that the complexity that we currently have and have to manage in the operating system uh, are just going to be coming back in a few years' time when we see that there's more dependencies that cannot be accommodated in the firmware. So we're going to, in my, I fear that we will have to revisit this, revisit this again uh, in the future. The complexity is just going to creep up again because we're going to see that there are things that we can't do in firmware that we're going to have to start doing in the operating system again. Why is the firmware still kind of there? And, and then there will be battles between firmware and operating systems, and it will be get very complex. Yeah, but like if you have a solution that we can solve this problem in OS today, yeah, like happy. But do we have any other better solution today to deal with this? So um, you were saying something about you didn't want to. I, I I completely didn't understand one of the points you were trying to make about letting doing this on a device level instead of a resource level. I'm yeah, not sure yeah, what you're trying to, can you just, explain that more? Then yeah, you're just it. building up the case why we need, I'll just come to that soon. Uh, so this is just uh, just two different, like it could be a, uh, your application processor, modem controlling shared resources. So what I was trying to tell is like, instead of having all this information, can we just make it device centric and say and operate everything over the device like you just get a device id and you just say okay i want to power on or whatever state i want this performance level or i just want to reset so or just, just drive everything because the resource uh, in the previous slide as i showed the vms have to uh, like they just isolate the devices and having to give all the information around that device to each is at more complexity than just make it everything device centric and then say this is isolated and then deal with it and if so okay one second when you're saying device here are you talking in what context are you defining that are, are you talking about it as like a device as in the driver firm uh, driver core we're talking about a device that Yes, because, all, be. because for everything that you listed here, you have a corresponding thing on the right side. So I'm like not sure what the point you're trying to simplify here. I don't so see it. This device, as I said, it could be even a CPU or your uh, some uh, IP block, which uh, it could be a security engine or it could be a random number generator uh -huh. engine, whatever it could be. So okay, maybe uh, let me rephrase it and tell me if this is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Are you trying to say instead of SCMI exporting? Here are the 10 clocks that you could use, and here are the 10 reset states you could use. Are you trying to say, here are the 10 devices you could use, and out of these 10 devices, some of them have clocks, some of them have reset uh, control. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, or those are... Uh, are, you, are you trying to like encapsulate the clocks and performance like as a subset of each device? Not a subset of each device. It's like, instead of having all this operate on the device and let the firmware or the platform deal with what is the clock it's connected to, power domain connected to. But you still want to ask the frequency for the device. So. Yes. Uh, so, so the idea is that <clears throat> for each device, uh, you have a, a certain number of, of resources related to it. And then you can either control all these resources directly, or you can define power states, say, for the device and define those power states in terms of those resources. So you say, say for example, power state one is this clock is gated. Mm -hmm. Power state two is this clock is gated and that uh, regulator is in this mm -hmm. state, right? Is it what you're trying to say? Though? Yeah, I think so. so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so making it device specific or device centric, so, so I would so say. The, Linux or any OS running under the VM uh, would never actually specifically try to change a clock or a power domain. They is need that what not trying to say? have that information. Is okay. I'm trying to. The question I have is that, like, in Linux, how do we drive this? So this is how we would like 
to drive the specification towards because this removes a lot of complexity. But how do we drive this in Linux is my open question here. Like, do we just use, reuse the power, gen pd power domain? And since it already have this performance level, do we extend it or do we come up with some different solution to altogether? I'm okay. just opening that. Doesn't it just hook in, right in into the YAMPD YAM structure? All you have to do is specify the domain and then you can do whatever you want yeah. on the, on the back end part of the yeah, callback. Yeah, I'm just asking the question here. So I'm so, fine. So. It's before we get into there, I just want to okay. get the opinion of how would we look this, uh, how do we want to solve this in Linux? So essentially, depending on the granularity you want to, you want to um, kind of control things, uh, you can either define a PM domain like ACPI does yes. with a set of, um, of operations in there. And that could be called like a SCMI PM domain and then work pretty much the same way as, as the ACPI PM domain does. Or you hook up the GenPD at the kind of lower level. But then you have to expose the, <clears throat> uh, the power domain hierarchy through, through a device tree, right? Uh, For that to work, actually. Yeah, the, in the idealistic world, we want just the leaf node, not the hierarchy. Leave the hierarchy to the well, yeah, some, firmware, but some cases, yeah, some, yes, some I agree. A yeah. part of it, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so the, it depends on, on, on the granularity that you want to, uh, the, where, where, you, where you want to have your control, uh, control plane, essentially, yeah. right? So the idea is to have something either connect to GenPD or create this uh, CMI power domain and create one for each device. Uh, have you tried anything? Uh, no, no, it's like, it's yeah, just already. new idea, so, so I'm just trying to. So, so, so I guess, okay. Uh, so I guess the, uh, my advice would be to try to do it in this way and that way and compare and then, yeah. then have an idea what's simpler, what works for you. Yeah. Because at this point it's like, we, yeah, well, yeah you, can do, you can do this, you can do that. You can do something else. It would be good to have like an example to yeah. look at, right? So um, another question that is kind of like my pet peeve with the CMI. I just want to call it out here. <laughs> um, if a CMI is going to be adopted, is ARM's position or upstream position going to be every firmware needs to follow a CMI going forward? No, like at least for the solution space we are addressing here, they should not come up with something which is just but an alternate, not, right? which makes no sense for no add-on. So that would what I would say. Like, so like, if it's I just see that another protocol is... trying to solve the same problem, yeah, I would say no. But okay. if it's addressing something out of okay. the like, then I'm okay. That's an okay question to have. But just one thing that I noticed was that with all of these things, SAMI effectively makes fast switching impossible on ARM for CPU frequency. We scaling. do have that today, uh -huh. or in the latest. Uh, so uh, are you already having a separate the, protocol for CPU frequency? No, system? we discovered that this has a, a fast transport where it just says, this is the registers you can just write. And it's... Okay, so, part of the petri is gone. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Not nothing, I think that. See if it wakes up. That would be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> We're about to do a talk on suspend resume. See how the other guys do. It may not wake up. That would be. 
freaking hysterical. All right. Yeah, I have a bunch of data on here that uh, can't really get to otherwise. Uh, so my name's Len Brown. Uh, it's not this. Uh, I don't really have slides. I'm just going to show you some stuff. Um, I work at Intel Open Source Technology Center, along with a couple of guys in this room, if you don't know me. And um, today we're going to talk about suspend resume quality in Linux. So um, five years ago, who was at, uh, who was at uh, Linux Plumbers in Seattle? Okay, well, then you may recognize some of this, because that's when we introduced this tool called... Um, at that time, it was called Analyze the Spend. And now um, the way we ship it is in a part of this project called um, PM Graph. It also has Boot Graph in it, but today we're going to talk just about the Suspend, suspend um, Graph part. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is actually go to a web page that you can get to. It's 01.org PM Graph. Um, and I'm just going to highlight some stuff from the getting started for those of you that weren't in that session five years ago. Uh, very simple. Oh, good. You can actually see. Uh, you can clone this. It's open source. Um, make install, run it, uh, run it as root. It's really that simple. Um, does have some. This tool does have some um, uh, kernel dependencies. Most distros have all of these in there um, already. Um, and if you don't have all of them, then some, some pieces of functionality work and some do not. I'll talk about that a little bit more when we go through examples of how the tool works. Um, and then uh, basic usage. Um, it would be sort of like this. You say sleep graph minus m mem would be for a suspend to mem. If you do a freeze, it would do a suspend to idle. Um, RTC wake says after you've been sus actually right before you suspend arm the RTC to wake up in 15 seconds it can be whatever number you like that's how we usually run it you could run it without that for uh, testing other wake up sources um, <clears throat> but for our automated testing that's what we use because we don't have somebody there to press a button um, there's a bunch of options you can stick them into config files um, and I think now I'm going to show you some, oh, uh, a couple of things we can do with it. This is an example output, but you know what? I'm going to go to a, 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 re a real web page. So it's an HTML page like this. Um, on the top, it says, you know, what it is. This is run on a 9360, which there's probably some in this room. It's a pretty good Linux laptop uh, from Dell. And uh, uh, suspend time was 247 milliseconds. Resume time was three quarters of a second. Um, in purple, it reports, it self-reports how long it was in firmware. I don't believe what it's reporting here. It's saying one millisecond. Um, but some of them are actually accurate. Um, uh, so that's sort of inf informational. And then uh, what you're seeing on the screen is a graph from left to right in time. Uh, we initiated the suspend here about a quarter second before the actual suspend. SR, this is the line between suspend and resume. And then um, all of this to the right is how long it took us to wake up. And this basically says where the time went. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a suspend to mem. Um, and mem, uh, which commonly, commonly is a setup to do an ACPI S3, but it, it could be a suspend to idle on another machine. But what you'll see on the suspend to mem is this blue and red is the low-level suspend and resume that you don't see with suspend to mem where you're, you know, you're offlining your processors and so forth. Uh, this is actually a pretty common um, scenario right here um, where, you know, your big, your big guy might be uh, NVMe on suspend side and uh, USB is our nemesis on the resume side for, for, for a typical system. Um, uh, HD audio not as much of a problem as it used to be. And uh, often graphics, I don't know if this example right here has uh, graphics on or off. If the graphics was off when you suspended, then, then it will look different. Um, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can, um, you know, if we wanted to go look at our, our CPUs offline, they'd be in here, for example. Um, 
There's our machine suspend, resu machine resume, calls into the BIOS. It's all here. Um, there's a couple of, uh, just a couple of other things I'd like to point out with this tool, and then I'm going to talk about why I'm talking about this tool uh, today, which is what we want to do with it. Um, actually, there's a, I think there's an example on the web page. At one point, we were very concerned about back-to-back uh, -back suspend resume, so there's an X2. Sometimes there, um, to make suspend go faster, um, some things got deferred to the right side of that, uh, that yellow bar, and you can't resume until those things have finished. You can't suspend again until those things have finished resuming. So this can be interesting, um, particularly in the case where you have a, a low latency wake up from, from a network. You want to wake up, uh, wake up, wake up, wake up. Well, if you're still, you know, you can't go back to sleep, you can't, you know, if you're spending all your time suspend resuming, then um, uh, you can't get any work done. You're basically on all the time. So we need fast suspend and resume and uh, nothing deferred in between them that delays the next one. Um, that's pretty important on some machines. On a laptop, you know, if, if something takes under a second, most people are pretty happy. Um, but I'm showing you sort of the success cases here. There are a lot of non-success cases, and with that, I'm going to go to a summary. So um, first, I have to apologize. We usually um, put our summary into a Google Sheet, and this has been exported so that I could show it on this kind of laptop, and I'm really pretty bad at, at Windows. Um, but what this is is a list of machines, and um, uh, it's the... It's the output of a number of tests. So say there's a Dell 9380 at the top, um, and the line two is uh, we ran freeze for 24 hours, uh, and um, it suspended and resumed 2,500 times. Uh, similarly with MEM, 2,700 times. Um, this particular test setup we run for 24 hours, and however many we fit in there. Another test lab we have, uh, we run generally around 2,000 cycles. Um, let's see, uh, this health, uh, we have a summary where we um, sort of weight different things, like if it crashed, that would be, that would really impact uh, this health, so we could sort, sort by health. Um, I do have machines which are 100% healthy, they're just not on here. Um, and uh, let's see, um, pass, fail, and, and hang, um, so uh, one way you can run the tool is, uh, one way re we run the tool is, uh, we would run it, say, for 24 hours on a system which has no state and so um, on disk. And so when it resumes, then we pull the data off. Well, if it, if it failed to resume, then we've lost the um, results. Uh, and so from our point of view, that's a hang and, and there's no result to look at, which is pretty annoying. Whereas on the ones we, we have with the disk, you can go back, you can... Uh, reboot the machine, you still have your, um, your system uh, results there. Um, package C10 and SysLPI are sort of some details. This, probably a graphic is better for this. So this is suspend max, uh, medium, and min time. So this first one, uh, the maximum suspend time was 5.8 seconds. These are all in milliseconds. Uh, resume, uh, seven seconds usually two seconds and a half a second for resume. For that particular machine, it's sort of a new machine which uh, still has some quirks. All right, so what do we do with this? Um, we have this whole huge list of machines. Actually, we have a list a lot longer than this. I, I only have public machines here. Um, so there's a, you know, what we happen to have in our lab, this is an Oregon lab. Uh, we have a couple of Dells, thank you, Dell. And uh, I think a Galaxy Book is a Samsung. Like Samsung, and um, some HPs, some MacBook in there, um, and then uh, a couple of Lenovo machines, and um, and we've scrubbed all of these results, which have been running for 24 hours a day, and uh, you know, in priority order, the first thing we do is grep for bad things in dmessage, and so say on this 9360, uh, you know, this DMAR. D this happened uh, um, 2,800 times out of 28 tests. So uh, what we're trying to do when we are casting this net and looking for failures is to find out what happens all the time, what's intermittent. Um, if I want to debug something, where do I go debug it? Um, 
if I ran more tests on this machine, would I learn any more, or is it better to run on that machine over there? Okay. And um, what we're learning is that after around 2,000 tests, you pretty much got a good idea what this machine's going to do. Um, I remember the day when I was, actually it, was, it wasn't too long ago, where doing two suspend resumes on Linux was a big freaking deal. Like if you could do it and then you did it again, you're like, yes! Um, now it's like 2,000 and, uh, you know, somebody else wants the machine for something else. Cause, um, so really what we want to do now is, is, is find more faults from more machines. But let me scroll down. Um, so these happen 100% of the time, but down here, you'll get, uh, sorry, like I said, I'm, I'm bad at this. Um, you'll get a lot of things that out of, uh, say, um, uh, one, you know, 0.08% of the time we got some error message on, say, this, this Dell. Okay, so the BIOS basically freaked out. Um, we have no idea. It looks like a fan tried to turn itself off at some point. But it only happened 0.8% of the time, 0.08. And uh, that's, that's a tough one. That's a tough uh, path to, to follow, to debug that. So um, we cast this net and we filed a bunch of bugzillas. This is an example of one. By the way, I should say that all the stuff in this spreadsheet, Paul? Um, I was I'm just curious, is there some way to accelerate the failure rate? For example, you mentioned the fan. Is it possible to support the fan on and off at odd times while you're suspending your resume? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so w when you have a bug that's difficult to reproduce, how do you force it to happen more often? In, in that case, right? in that case, yeah, yeah. In that case, so for the fan, if you were debugging that one in particular, which we do have some work going on in that, on that particular thing right now. Um, yeah, we could perhaps provoke that failure without even suspending and resuming just by turning the device on and off. And with, with runtime device power management, we can do that. Uh, this is one that actually, I like this example the best because it's something that's it's on a bunch of different machines. So basically, you may see in some of our bugzillas, we suck a cookie. Um, basically, uh, we have a script that goes out to Bugzilla and says, oh, do I see that bug in this test result? Okay. And so, say I were looking for this bug, I'd say, well, on this Dell 9370, which is a Cabby Lake refresh, I saw it 400, 400 times, which is 17% of the time. That's a good machine to debug this problem. Okay. But it's, this, is this, this is a sound one. Um, very intermittent, but you'd see all, all these other machines, it's like, whoa, okay, this thing's happening 0.07 times on this, on say, in the 9360. Um, and we have, you know, we, we have really, really had no idea. This one is actually a 5.0 result. We've actually fixed this. Um, but then there's, there's other bugs where, you know, it disappeared, like on these particular machines, this bug, we found none of the test results, all 0% of the time, uh, found this failure. Um, and these are just what we have happened to have documented. And then over here, um, this PCIe port device bug, this happens 100% of the time on the 9380. So, um, so one thing that we can do is we can look and see, okay, if I want to, um, let's see, kernel issues. So we've got, so we're, we're scraping for kernel issues. We're scraping for filed bugs. Um, and now we're looking for um, slow devices. I didn't really show, except for USB, that some devices sometimes are very slow. There's, I think there's an example in here where something took 50 seconds and that amount of time somebody's gonna press the button, right? So catastrophic failure. Um, and here, in fact, we have so sorted the worst suspend devices. Here's one, 32 seconds um, for this device on a MacBook Pro and it's the Nouveau driver, so. Um, not sure what to say about that, but um, uh, the interesting thing is that the, um, the average time, so the average time was one, one second, but one, one time it took 32 seconds out of 6,000 times that it was the worst device. And you can go all the way down, you know, this is, we can sort all of our, our devices to, you know, I think where we did the cutoff at, um, uh, very low for, you know, some of these, some of these other like CPU on and off for some reason, they're very slow on the Mac. I think they've got their MTRs set up wrong or this is a Braswell. That's a, an old 
uh, slow machine. So we can, we can say, okay, from, from the population of failures, which ones are the most dramatic? Um, we can see how often they happen. And say I go to worse resumed devices. And then we can say, say here's the 915. I could say, well, for all the results I have, for the million results I have, um, on what machines is the 915 the slowest device? Oh, okay, so I can scroll over and say, oh, well, um, it's uh, great. This one right here is the machine I want to debug um, the 915 on because basically 3,000 times that's the slowest device. So if I want to work on that device, it's easy to um, uh, sort them. So um, Anyway, so what we have is, we have this capability, A, you should be running it, particularly if you're concerned about um, suspend resume performance, particularly if you're concerned about it on a particular laptop you may have, B, you should be filing bugs. Um, uh, C, we are doing this automatically and we are, we have moved from the um, does it work and to how fast it is into the how reliable is it stage. We still have problems where it fails. We still have problems where it's slow, but now we're, gee, does it run all night uh, stage? And for the most part, it does. Um, and um, now the thing that we've discovered is we have 30 machines, but what we need is 3,500 machines. And my lab has a budget, but it's not gonna have 3,500 machines. So what I'd really like is I'd really like this test run by, say, Ubuntu, like opt in, send inf interesting information back to Ubuntu and have the, these results squirreled away when, I, when your random Ubuntu user does their suspend resume, uh, somewhere where somebody can debug them and have their finger on the pulse of how is Linux suspend resume working out in the wild, um, we can observe that. And not only that, maybe even have enough information that we can go debug it and attack it. So I'm interested to know if anybody has any insight into public telemetry, because that's what I really want. We're really good on the private telemetry. Are you publishing this data already? Um, not until today. Am I publishing this data? So um, say like, uh, you know, if I were looking at this, um, uh, say this bug report, right? So yeah, we. We, 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 we let people know that we have this, 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 this um, and uh, particularly in the bug, bug reports that we find, yes, I'm seeing this on the following 18 machines, or I'm seeing this on this one weird machine over there. Um, um, but it's not, it's not in some public place where, say, I got run over by a bus, somebody else could say, oh yeah, and let's go work on the number one bug, you know. If, if we weren't pushing this, I don't know if we, you know, we don't really have a lot of community, we have a bunch of a couple of people at Intel working at this, but I, I'd like to, I'd like to be broader than that. You know, I'd like to leverage the diversity of the community uh, for a number of reasons. One is, um, one is because the community has a lot more laptops than I have. Even if all the community did was report bugs, that would be a huge boon to us because we could say, oh my gosh, look at, look at all these bugs that are appearing on this class of machine. Um, so, any ideas, thoughts? Some sort of uh, so, so, I mean, I've talked about this with a couple of people, mm -hmm. and say in um, Seattle, I said, hey, we have this tool, and the guys in this room, the people that care about power management, go run it, and some people said, sure. I mean, you could all have downloaded it and run it in the time I've been talking. Nobody has. Um, and very few, people have, very few people have sent the results back to me, or, or anybody that can um, debug them. Um, so I think, I think we're now past the stage where, hey, we'll get the community, I'm gonna volunteer my system for testing. No, what we really want is during the day, I've suspended and resumed eight times today, I could have sent eight results back, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, automatically, by opting in, right? By opting in, or maybe one eighth of them, or, or you know, some sampling, some number larger than zero, and that would be really useful because this is just a table of the 15 machines that, that we have right here, and we've, we've found some really interesting um, issues that you would never, you'd say, 
you know, in your own laptop, if it didn't work 100% of the time, you're like, oh, I must have done something wrong, or maybe I sat on my laptop, whatever, reset it. But no, if it, if it recorded it, you know, we'll see one out of 2,000, we'll see that, oh, wait, that's a real failure. And if we can nail that one out of 2,000, then people will really start to trust suspend with Zoom even more. So I want to I wanna have a more machines with 100% health for 2,000 tests. That's my goal. I have some, but it's a very short list. Every, everyone has some blemish of some minute. It's 100% perfect is a, is a high bar. So um, yeah, I, I'm thinking opt-in. Um, um. And where do the results get stored? I should say that the, the results are like about, it's about 100K for one of these web pages. Uh, yes, it's compressible. We can, we can save the data without generating HTML to squeeze it down. Um, or we could just send the summaries. Um, we have a script that will, will generate a Google Doc of a, a Google Sheet of a summary of an entire directory of thousands of results. So if we could even just upload them somewhere and then you could run your favorite scraping tool to go look for problems, that would work. But we need a repository and we need the community uploading those results. I mean, I think it's a great idea. It's just that, uh, how about, how, how do you think uh, you're gonna solve the problem of having tests done on um, distro kernels? On distro kernels? This will run on a distro kernel. No, I meant like, uh, you may see a problem that's only reproducible on your I don't care, kernels. yeah. So most of the time, it doesn't matter. I mean, at this point, there was a time when it was pretty frantic getting suspend resume running. Now it's, it's, it's usually it's a device, like, um, you know, there's a couple of, I won't make fun of them, but there's a couple of choice devices that our OEMs choose to save like 10 cents. And um, yeah, uh, so, uh, Usually it's a device, and that's a device driver, and, and the distro is the same driver upstream has. So, yeah. It, it's, it's, more, it's more information. Did I just turn myself off? You did. How did I do that? Sorry. It's now red. Is that bad? That's your... Oh, she's, she's coming. My phone just talks to me, too. Everything's malfunctioning up here. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Is that up? Yes. It's always the battery. It's the first I wanted to, to comment. This is uh, inspiring. It's a good. Uh, I'm impressed by this project. I didn't think about this, and it's a great idea. Uh, you obviously may want to talk to distro people. This has to uh, go into the default images of the uh, most uh, um, popular distribution. This is one thing uh, that I can think of. Obviously, um, there is this. Uh, uh, should I send back the bug report to somebody is more sensitive to this than others? But I don't know, Firefox sent tons of telemetry back home and uh, people accept that. I was thinking that a um, uh, um, privileged venue to advertise this kind of work is uh, the FOSDEM uh, conference in uh, Br Br Brussels in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. It um, stands for Free and Open Source Developer European Meeting. And it's a place where this kind of stuff is uh, really taken uh, to heart. Like you would have people cheering for you if you show them this, because they say, yes, this is something I can really contribute to just, uh, mm. and, and the suspend resume is some, is affects everybody and everybody hates it. Like when I don't see my laptop coming back, it's not something like, I don't know, my network doesn't do IPv6, yeah. I mean, right, I, right. Am, I, I am on the network. It's very visible, before. right. Some but people think suspend resume, suspend resume, it's really resume something are. like, it's synonymous. mission critical, you know, so people yeah. are going to be enthusiastic about this if you or some of your uh, collaborators can, can go and present there and have, uh, and also you will meet a lot of these people there. Uh, like, uh, so you will have people approaching you saying, uh, we, sh we should do this for Fedora, we should do this for OpenSUSE, we should do this for Ubuntu. Bostom, okay, good suggestion, thank you. Yeah, so, um, if any, does any, first of all, I should, does anybody have any uh, questions about the tool itself or its results? Um, because I sort of just sort of skipped through that a little bit, but you can all look at that. You can run it and look at your own results. It creates an HTML file. You open the file and you have what's on the screen right here. So I think you mentioned already, but uh, does it have an option to output a, a computer readable um, format? 
Well, um, it's, or is it only HTML? It's it's it creates uh -huh. it it saves the D message and an, and an F trace log and a tool specific log. Okay. And then a separate program comes and renders this from that. So you could grep through it if you wanted another tool. You could do that too. Um, yeah. A couple, get the mic back there. In the best pass. Uh, I think that there's some privacy implications for this, of course. So have you thought about what sort of things you'd be filtering from D message uh, that would be sent up with this yet? Uh, so, yeah, so like if I, c we, like we save the D message here, I guess maybe, why can I make that bigger? Um, we save the D message from when you start to suspend to when you resume to see if something jumps out. Um, we have some other logs involved, uh, a tool specific log that grabs some stuff from the system that's useful. Um, there is an option to um, trace processes that are to show what's running because sometimes a process will be doing something and will hang up a device and then the, hang, the device hangs up suspend, you know, like you're, I don't know, you're reading something out on Thunderbolt or something. Um, and so, but that's an option. That's not, that's not on by default. Um, this bit here, like where we can see actually the one in front of us, this is an M sleep. This is, uh, yeah, so a couple vendors have this. I think it's a bug workaround. That's hard coded into the BIOS. It's sort of embarrassing, but that's a, uh, yeah, it is what it looks like. Um, it's a two second sleep in the BIOS. There's really nothing we can do about it. You're like, yeah, it's, I think it's an off method for maybe it's a fan or something. I forgot what. Yeah. yeah. So it's, this isn't the, HP has this one too. Yeah, so there are uh, systems in which there are things like that in, the, in AML. Essentially, they, they, wake, well, they, they wait for a certain fixed time because yes, it's bad. to work around some issues. And, 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 and I believe this one, the workaround is only for resume. So the suspend side is completely bogus. But yeah, I mean, you can really, you, closer you look at a BIOS, the more you can embarrass a BIOS guy. And we could do that all day long, but that's really not what I want to right. talk about today. <laughs> that's not the there. Yeah. yeah, so we have two, two minutes. I'll show a different one. I'll show a happier uh, one. Lance, we have two minutes left for this topic, so. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just asking questions, so I really had nothing to sh I think. So there are two things there. Um, Actually, the packaging, packaging that stuff was easy, and I actually did for the OpenSUSE, and I want to try to push up to the factory. And, but uh, the question is how to, so where to gather the data? So where to upload that's not defined yet? Right, right. right. So if, say, Google stepped forward and said, hey, you can stick this on our Google Drive <laughs> with some credentials, we'd all be really happy about that because we know how to do you know, how to get to that. Yeah, that's, that I'm not sure. Also. There's, um, you know, so this spreadsheet here had a, you know, say I ran 2,000. We save all 2,000 results, but um, we also save, we can also just reduce this down to save, like, say, these. Like, this, each one of these is a link to the fastest, slowest, and median, and it's a real result. I can open any of these. At least I should be able to open any of those. And that's the median for this machine. So instead of all 2,000, there's like about a dozen interesting ones, you know, like the slowest device, the fastest device, you know, anything with an oops or a kernel message in it, um, we grab, you know, we grab those. And then a lot of them are just repeats, so we don't really have to store that. But yeah, I'd, I'd ballpark about 100K per, per result. We have to store that someplace. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the uh, related question is, uh, so suppose that we get a data and we have a bug report for that and we fix that, but how to verify the fix? Um, well, I mean, we run this every RC actually. And so this 5.0, the bug I showed you with the audio is gone. Yeah, right? in that yeah. case, yeah, you guys have the machines, but in the case, suppose that some, we, get, we get the data from the pub, someone else publicly. Yeah. Then how to verify that. That's, that's I don't know, like uh, any other bug, yeah. you know, you debug it, you make it go away on what's in front of you, and hopefully it goes away with it for everybody else. Sometimes yeah. that works. Uh, but, 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 but if they run it again and we get a result for that machine and it's clean, then we know it works. So this, this, this also happens for regular bugs, like, you know, Bugzilla. You, you, you're, you, somebody finds the bug, you yeah. 
you see it, you, you fix it, and then there's no response. You have to assume that it has been fixed, right? Uh, yes. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, in the case of Bugzilla, it's clear that there is a bug reporter. But in that, so voluntary, we, get, we gather the data for improved bench. And, but we, yeah, don't know exactly who submitted the data and yeah. who can verify that and improve bench. So, say for this one, what we did was we, we put a little attachment in the bug report which sort of has a profile, this uh, issue.def, so that our tool would go out and say, okay, here's the result. And then, then we, we, we could see that that thing I showed you with the audio bug, um, that was all done automatically by comparing this bug report with um, those test results. And we could see that it was on all these machines in 5.0. It's gone in 5.0 RC, whatever it was, uh, 5.1 RC6. So yeah, Bugzilla's good. If we can get into Bugzilla, we're in pretty good shape. So what, what, just to clarify, what's your idea right now? Do you want people to send the reports to you, or do you want the distros First of to all, collect? filing bugs, we're all good with that. But yeah, what we really want, what, what, what the, the, grand, uh, the grand strategy is, we want to get data, stuff running on all kinds of machines. That's what we really want. Is we want to cast a broad net. We can, we can run 24 hours a day on a machine we have in front of us, but I need 3,000 machines. Yeah. That's really, the, that's really the message. I think there's one last. Yep. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Victor Ruiz. I work in, in Red Hat. I own Suspend Resume. I work on the kernel hardware enablement team, <clears throat> QE. You have a pull request from me on GitHub uh, from two years ago, so I'm very interested in, in your work. Um, <clears throat> actually, I have a question about the, the tool itself, whether you are thinking about doing a client uh, client-server architecture to be able to get data when something go goes wrong uh, because if the machine doesn't uh, resume then you are losing data. Yeah, that's a good question. So we, 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 we basically have been running it via SSH on when we have that situation. Um, but uh, that hasn't been a priority yet anyway. Okay, but let's talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Artem. I work for Intel from Finland. The subject of my talk is the C-state latency measurement infrastructure. Brief introduction. So in Intel, we've developed a tool for measuring C-state latency. We call it WULT, which stands for Wake Up Latency Tracer. Right now, we are going through the process of open sourcing it. Unfortunately, we were not done yet. But uh, as soon as we get the company approval, we will publish it on GitHub under the GPL license. Uh, this tool has user space components and a kernel driver. And the plan is to upstream the kernel driver. So the reason I'm here is to get early feedback on the world kernel drivers and uh, how do we transform them into something upstreamable. Okay, so let's talk about what exactly we measure and how we do this. I'll walk you through a simplified version of, a, of one single measurement cycle. So we start with ARM in a delayed interrupt. I'll talk a little bit more about what it is, but just assume for now that the measured platform 
has a capability of generating an interrupt at a precise pre-programmed time in the future, sort of like a timer, but there are some nuances there. So we arm the delayed interrupt so that it should happen at launch time in the future. And then since we are measuring an idle system, it will at some point go to a C state. On Intel platforms, the CPU instruction that we execute to enter a C state is M weight. I think on ARMS it's something like WFI. Yeah, so, okay, so the measured CPU executes M weight. It stops executing further instructions. Uh, it enters the C state, sits there, saving power and waiting for an event like an interrupt to happen. Then when it's launch time, the delayed interrupt actually happens. It gets delivered to the measured CPU and kicks off the process of exiting the C state. This process will take some time, but when it's finished, the CPU will start executing the instructions after the M wait, and that's the point where we take the time after idle timestamp. So, the C state exit latency is the period of time between launch time and the time after idle. In other words, it's a time between the moment we, the delayed interrupt happens until the moment the CPU starts executing instructions. So the C state latency is this uh, difference. And that's basically what we measure and how we do it in a, in a nutshell, the principle. Any questions so far? I, I assume that if there are questions, you, you can just interrupt me. I mean, you don't need to, you need to, don't need to wait. Okay, a few words, why is it useful? Okay, so the C state latency information is, today is the foundation for the power management quality of service subsystem. On Intel platforms, we get this information either from the firmware, through the ACPI tables, or from the driver, from Intel idle driver. They are just hard-coded there. Now, the truth is that these numbers are not always 100% correct. Uh, and they also may depend on platform configuration. So, you know, if, you, if we have an, a tool that is easy to use and that can measure these latencies, we will open lots of opportunities for improving this subsystem. For example, we can improve numbers in Intel idle driver. Uh, other point is that if you're someone who is building a real-time-ish product, and for some reasons you are going to use C states, maybe some of them, then measuring their latency is probably crucial for your product. And uh, with this tool, you wouldn't need expensive lab equipment to do so. So can you just repeat again, uh, what, what were the um, requirements from your hardware to use your tool or your driver? Yeah, th so the question is, what are the requirements from the hardware to use the tool? So the requirement is to be able to generate a delayed interrupt. And I said I would, I would talk a little bit later, and I will very soon. Okay. Yeah. But before I will talk about that, I'll just very briefly show a quick a visual example. Just, you know. Sure. So the, this talk is not about, you know, talking about the results and all that uh, and user space. It's about drivers, but I thought just showing an example of this example will help, help understanding what we are doing. So this is a snapshot from a report. In this case, it's the scatter plot. Every dot is one single measurement. On the X, we have the amount of time we spent in the M weight before the interrupt happened. We call it silent time, it's in milliseconds. On the Y axis, we have the C state latency. It's in microseconds. Now, so in HTML, you can hover your mouse over a dot and then you get this little pop-up menu that tells details about the C state. In this specific case, uh, what, do, what do we have here? We, it says that we spent 2.5 milliseconds in M weight before the interrupt happened and it took us 94 microseconds to wake up and then the Linux requested C6 but um, you know the C state counters tells us that we were around 1% in CC0, core C0, like 13% in core C1 and so on and 73% in PC6 that's yeah and that, so yeah, it's it's not it's not my goal to talk about the results. It's just a quick example. 
Okay, now let's talk about uh, implementation details. Now, if you have like rotten tomatoes prepared, don't throw it at me immediately. Uh, do hesitate. It's, it's how I, it's implemented, right? It's uh, not necessarily what we need to do in upstream. Okay. Okay, delayed interrupts. So on your question. Mm -hmm. So today, in how we implemented it now, we use the I210 network card to generate delayed interrupts. So it's, uh, it's a gigabit, gigabit Ethernet card, PCI Express device that you can buy in many shops around the globe. Uh, now, the nice thing about it, it has a built-in clock, high-precision clock that host can read, and it also can generate an interrupt, a delayed interrupt for you. So basically what we do, we read the clock from the card, add a delay, write it back, tell the card, generate interrupt at that point, and then we can go in, into embed. Now, is this the only device that can do this? Uh, do you affine the interrupt to the CPU? Yes. Uh, the question is, do you affinitize the interrupt to CPU? Yes. So we select a CPU that we measure, affinitize the interrupt to that CPU. That's, that's right. Now, yeah, it's, it's not the only device that can do this. It's what we use. I, I know other NICs can do this, and uh, there are other types of devices that can, can do this. For example, you can use display controller for that. Okay, so now the question is why not using the timers, right? They are perfect source of delayed interrupts. They're designed for that. Uh, the answer is that on Intel platforms, they are too perfect. They are so perfect that uh, they make C-state latency invisible. So the problem is that the P unit, the microchip inside the C Intel chip or PMC, uh, it, it is aware of timers. So it will pre-wake the system, the core, and uh, you know, hide this latency and make it disappear or drop substantially. So in Intel platforms, we need to use something external. That's what we, why we use the network card. But probably there are platforms out there where timers could be used. So yeah, that's on delayed interrupts. Now, high level design, how we did it, how we did implemented this. Okay, so today we have two kernel components. And I will be talking just about the kernel. Everything I show is our kernel components. So we have two models. We implement this as models. One is called Wult. One is called, the other is Wult IGB. So the main logic of measurement is implemented in Wult. And Wult IGB is a simple driver that knows how to talk to the network card. Okay? So Wult implements an API and Wult IGB Sorry, Wult, Wult defines the API Wult IGB implements it. So from Wult point of view, Wult IGB is just a delayed interrupts provider. It could be some other device, something else. So it's a small layer of abstraction. Now in, in Linux today, there is a standard driver for these network cards. It's called IGB, Intel Gigabit, I guess Ethernet. Uh, so what we do, we unbind the NIC from this driver and then bind it to Wult. So IGB doesn't own it anymore. Uh, Wult IGB driver is very small comparing to IGB. All we do, we reset, reset the card. We do a few initialization steps, and then it's ready to be used as delayed interrupt source. We don't initialize the PHY. We don't need to allocate rings and deal with these descriptors. No complexity. It's very tiny comparing to IGB. Okay, now, one of the components in the Wult driver is what we call armor kernel thread. It's a kernel thread, and the mission of this thread is to continuously arm delayed interrupts. So all it does, it will pick a delay, uh, arm the interrupt, wait for it to happen, and continue this again and again and again. That's all it does. Then we have a debugging, debug FS interface for configuring this stuff. For example, you can enable disable measurements. You have these delay and min, min and max knobs where you can set the uh, interrupt delay range, so the thread will pick a random number in this range and arm the interrupt that far away. Okay, I'm, I'm just zooming the out companies, so just to recap what we have is a driver with a thread, it arms interrupts and waits for them to happen, otherwise the system is idle, the measured CPU has plenty of time to go to a C state, so what happens, it, it will go to insist in a C state, the interrupt will wake it up, then it goes to assist it again, and we repeat this. So now, how do we actually measure the latency? Okay, let's briefly talk about the current Intel idle flow. So we, we have the idle task, we have the CPU idle subsystem. 
Uh, so the subsystem will choose a C state and then will enter it by calling the enter callback. This will go into the idle driver. In our case, it's Intel idle driver. And Intel idle driver will ultimately call the m weight instruction. So here I, I assume that the measured CPU is CPU zero, but it can be anything else. And yes, the interrupts, uh, delayed interrupts are affinitized to that CPU. Okay, so we have another component in uh, Vult. We call it interposer. So it basically puts itself right there. The, uh, yeah, right there, just. Now with interposer, the flow looks like this. So CPU idle tries to call the idle driver, but in, it actually goes to the interposer. So we have chance to, to take some stuff like time before idle. Then we go back to Intel idle, go to M weight. From M weight, we go to Intel idle and back to interposer. We can measure stuff after idle and then we return to CPU idle. So now a few points here. Important points. One important point is that CPU idle disables interrupts and preemption right before calling to idle driver. So in interposer, we have the, this disabled. Uh, other point is that in current implementation, we don't modify CPU idle, we don't modify Intel idle. What we do is we uh, use KL sims to find the address of the function, and then we use ftrace to hook to it and interpose it. So no need to modify these subsystems. Okay, a few words about what we do in the interposer. So basically, when CPU idle calls enter, we, fer we take, we remember launch time, we take time before idle, we take snapshots of C state counters, then we go run Intel idle, which goes to M wait, we sleep, we wake up, we go back to interposer, we take statistics after idle, like time after idle, C state counter after idle, Linus. Why don't we just call it and wait ourselves? Right. Intel idle does the projection also. You're going to have to wait down to it. If you just did the yeah, end of it. Yeah, but I mean, what you would want to is uh, iterate over all the suggestions <coughs> and iterate over all the different distances, time distances, and, and get a scatter plot that way. Yeah, we, we could do something like this. Yeah, uh, we, yeah it's just. You know, there is lots of knowledge about C states in M weight. Oh, sorry, in Intel Idle. We, did just, I, we didn't, didn't want to uh, yeah. duplicate it, but that's the right point. We want to be as close to as weight as possible from both ends. And right now, we are, we are a little bit further away. Uh, I, I think it doesn't really matter. So we are talking about like hundreds of nanoseconds versus microseconds here, but we, we could do this. The other point is that with this sort of architecture, we could actually also hook to ACP idle. But yeah, that's an option. Yeah. I don't know if it answers the question. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, w the other thing we do, I just wanted to mention is that we try to check the wake reason. So if we think we woke up because of something else, not our interrupt, we just ignore all this data. But if we do think we woke up from interrupt, we send the data to user space. And how we do this? We use trace print K. <laughs> so that's where I, I hope rotten tomatoes don't fly at me. Uh, I know that this is like not a way to go in upstream, but this, that was a quick shortcut. So it ends up in the trace buffer, so user space picks it from the trace FS. And yeah, that's basically the current design. That's how it works. Um, so I have, have a list of challenges that I see uh, I, I can go to them un unless someone has, you know, comments or questions or suggestions. Okay, so again, now I, I need high level feedback. There are lots of details. Let's see, on high level, first kind of, first thing is where, if we to upstream this stuff, where would it live? I, drivers, idle, wood, something like that. That's what comes to mind. Any other ideas? All those in favor say aye. 
<laughs> okay, I mean, yeah, if, if no one, no one, uh, no comments, then probably it's this or we'll see. <laughs> okay, the other thing is the measurement data. So let's see, uh, what, what do we send now to upstream? Well, first of all, we send the launch time, the time before time after idle. Then we calculate delta TSC, delta A perf, M perf, and then we get statistics before and after idle for C states, and we send those, the deltas, to upstream. So it basically ends up right now being a one CSV line, you know, comma, comma separated line with, of, of numbers. And the, but the fir very first line will be the CSV header with a short name for those things. So what are, what are the issues here? First of all, obviously it's architecture dependent, right? But more than that, um, it also depends on which specific Intel platform we measure. C states are different on uh, Adams, on clients, on Xeons. Also, even MSR registers to read those C states are different on different platforms. And uh, we need to somehow read them so what we do today, we just read all the possible MSRs for all the possible C states we, we know for all the Intel platforms, right? And send lots of data. Now, luckily, in most cases, if we read C state counter for a C state that doesn't exist on this platform, we just read zeros and we send zeros. In other cases, we have an exception and then we just handle it. We remember we had an exception, never read it again, and just always send, put zeros. So the user space uh, recognizes that, okay, if for this C state, there are always zeros, then it either doesn't exist or it just disabled, then just ignore it. That's how we do it, but it's obviously it's not like nice and cool. Uh, ideally, we need to put knowledge to kernel about hardware C states on all, on all Intel platforms. Now, we have all this knowledge in the TurboStat tool, which is part of the kernel tree, but it's a user space tool. It, it, it's there. So it would be cool to have this knowledge inside the kernel instead. Now, so Len Brown is here. I talked to him. He says that he would also like to have this to, in TurboStat because it's a problem for TurboStat. Now, now TurboStat uses dev MSR and it reads these counters like one after another. So there is a big time gap between them. Also, the security people do, don't like dev MSR. They want to disable it. So TurboStat would also benefit from this. So probably we. We need something, some sort of function that would disable interrupts, preemption, and read all those counters. It would know all those counters for this platform, read them you know, in, a, in, a, in one go, and then kernel consumers could, consume, could, could run this function, and somehow we could, use, we could send it to user space if TurboStat wants it. What, what exactly do you mean by more state awareness in the, in the kernel? Mm. Oh, okay. So now, um, yeah, when I say C states, it's a little bit confusing. There are, so I like to, this terminology, there are requested C states, that's those, those that, C, that Linux can request, like arguments of the M weight uh, instruction, right? But under, under the hood, in the hardware, there are more C states than them, than this. I, I call them hardware C states. So now Linux is aware of those requested C states, but Linux kernel is not aware of the hardware C states. Oh, I see. So you are pretty much talking about um, about uh, residency counters. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all this knowledge is in TurboStat today. Yeah. So any any ideas? You know, suggestions how to do this sort of stuff. Uh, I guess maybe it's a question to to uh, Rafael. Why the hardware C states are not in, in the kernel yet? You mean residency counters? Or to Len. So, um, yeah, so uh, um, I've shown a couple people this patch, but what we're thinking of doing is moving the counters into perf, mm -hmm. where they'll be explicitly advertised by name, and so that a tool could look at them by name. What Artem wants them, I want them in user space, he wants them in the kernel space. So right now we're using just an offset that we know from the data book into dev MSR and that's convenient, but it has the downsides. Multiple system calls is one of them. So we want to be able to, we have to update perf to do this because you can't read multiple counters in one system call now. Um, and uh, we want to be able to name them with a vector. Um, so that's, I think, the solution to that problem. So maybe, maybe the, the um, to circle back on the question, um, 
the kernel cannot request for those specific uh, states then. So that's why it doesn't make sense to have it. So I, I, I think it, it's, it hasn't been needed in the kernel so far. Okay, so that's why, why it's not there. So I, I have a different question from an architecture point of view. Uh, I say this with no love for BPF, but this seems actually like quite a natural thing to try and solve with BPF because we could have arch-dependent compilation with the right MSRs. You can do a much better export path relative, re versus trace print K. You could, there is BPF and PUF interaction. It seems to solve a lot of problems. Has it been considered? Can we access the read? You'd have to extend BPF, the BPF program to give you the access to do that. Right? There, there, there are a few things you could do there. You could either have it be something that uh, side loads from, like, I'm not saying it works out the box. I'm just saying no, whether you extended the BPF yeah. instruction set or you had side load prior to the BPF program in uh, CPU idle, right? Both of those things would work. But both of those things seem much simpler than what's been outlined with respect to both the arc concerns and getting data in and out and doing some of the analysis. That, that, that's a kind of a general question. Yeah, no, we hadn't thought of that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's that's interesting suggestion. Okay, another thing, set of challenges are user space interfaces. Let's see. So first of all, debug FS. I feel like for upstream, we, if we were in upstream, it would need to be CCFS rather than debug FS. And I would imagine it would be something like sys class vault or any any suggestions here or yeah B if you if we go BPF I guess okay so for yeah so these are more like configure the measurements themselves like what are those delays oh they would be in the BBF program you mean right okay. Yeah, but also we, need, we would need enough to just switch it on and off. Uh, load and unload. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But if, if it's not BPF, then something like this would probably make sense as the, to start with. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But <laughs> let, let's, assume, let's assume we tried and, and something, something didn't work. Let's just assume. Mm -hmm. I, 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 would, I would make the meta suggestion, building on the meta suggestion, that if you tried BPF and it didn't work, what didn't work in BPF might give you guidance as to what this interface should look like. Right. Okay. So in, in BPF, how, how would it look like? Is it like I write a program in some, I, I don't know much about BPF, in some like uh, language, special language, and then I put it to the kernel and they, hey, it's compiled and kernel executed. Mm -hmm. but you, it, it compiles to native code, but obviously you have some specific like read MSR dependency for your arch bits here. So it would be a combination of that plus either some <coughs> extension to your program to allow it to make those reads or an extension to read and hand it off to the BPF program if it's activated. But both of those, I, I'm not suggesting either of those is the answer. I'm saying those are two possibilities. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, then, uh, yeah, this slide w was about trace print K. And my thinking about this, uh, yeah, so I, I, what I want to, okay, my vision here is that, first of all, the, by nature, this data that we send to upstream kind of belongs to tracing. It just feels like tracing is right, is, is the right fit. Now, of, of course, we shouldn't use trace print K. So I was thinking that if we, to you, if we can use F trace anyway, so we can CPU idle in CPU idle when we call the enter function, we already have a, a pair of trace events, trace points around the uh, enter invocation. So if we could hook to them, so we can we can take measurements before and idle and after idle. That's one. And then if we could create a dynamically from the model create a trace point, trace event that we can trigger, 
right? Because the problem now is that trace points are they are kind of static. You need to define the arguments in advance and like in compile time. In this case, if we don't know in advance what are our C states, what are going to be our arguments, we need to create a trace point, or trace event on the fly, right? And like dynamically from within the model. So if we had a way to dynamically create trace points, okay, Stephen taught us yesterday that trace points and trace events are different things. That's why I, I kind of get confusing. But yeah, so if we could dynamically define a trace event from within the model, that would help us. We could take the measurement, trigger this trace event, it goes to the F trace, and then perf can also consume it. I have a patches in my mailbox from Tom Zanussi. I'm not sure if he sent them upstream or not, but these patches implement exactly that. You can create a trace event from within the model by calling several functions within the kernel. So that looks very promising. I didn't try them. So yeah, that's my thinking. Any suggestions, comments here? So with BPF, you can hook up to existing trace points or you can use new trace points by, yeah, you, you could add trace points for that, for that and then hook up to them from the BPF program and then you can define the, uh, what information you will export from that. Yeah, right, so there, we, we have two tasks, right? One is to hook to before and after idle that's task number one. So we have the tr those trace yeah, points. So you just add trace points as you defined as you know places to hook up to. Right. And now we, we hook up, we collect data. Now we have something to deliver to user space. How do we deliver? Through which interface? So my thinking was to deliver, we dynamically create another trace event. Let's call it wool trace event. Sorry. Well, so I don't really have an answer ready for that, so we for let's the, just talk the, about it later. For the eBTF, the, uh, it can hook to the uh, trace point like the idle entry and the, or idle exit. This this has been existed in the color side. Right, right. I, I hooked. I have these hooks. Yeah. I, I run yeah. my interposes before and after. Fine. I, may, I have data now. Yeah. How do I deliver this data to user space? Uh, they, uh, the EPPF, they have the map, so they can to communicate the data from the color side to the user side. So you okay. can, but um, for the EPPF, I follow up one question that um, uh, the difficult thing that uh, um, how you can uh, dynamic to uh, create the map or to create the EPPF program based on the different the CPU topology and the, the CPU idle states. So before that, uh, I r write the program like a hard code to that. So I'm not sure how, how to do that. And I just to bring up maybe you need to uh, resolve this. So the UBPF that and you need to dynamic to get to know the CPUs, how many CP CPU, are, how many CPU numbers and what's the CPU idle states. Then you need to create the UBPF the program. So, this may, might be an issue. Okay, so basically what I hear is that BPF has mechanisms. So you yeah. go figure out how to do it through BPF. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay. Um, you said I wa you want to hook before and after something, right? Yeah. I am not sure I understand that part because the this event that you have is something that after you walk up from uh, a, an idle residency, you have a number, which is the exit latency, right? Yes. So why do you want to hook up before and after? I mean, you have, you have yeah. the number. You just want to be after. Yes. Like when you after this, uh, the res residency completed, then you have a number, which is the, the exit latency. But exactly, I understand yeah. this being before and after something. Yeah. Like if, if you want to compute a difference, you have the difference. It's the, it's the, neck, it's the Nick who's computing that. So yeah. there's no before and after anything, You're just after. So if for every data point we need only a single number and this is the latency, that, that's enough. Now, we need more data than that. We need several other things. First of, first of all is the C-stage residency. So in, in x86 we have counters that just count amount of cycles you spent in this C-state 
I'm talking about hardware assistance now. In these hardware assistance, like let's say Core C1, Core C6, Package C2, Package C6, these are absolute numbers. So we need to take snapshot of them before idle, uh -huh. before and wait, and after and wait, and then have the delta. Then we know that out of 100% how much we spend in this and that and that. So because that is very helpful when you actually start analyzing the data and figuring out why it goes down here. Oh, it's because you don't have you know package C6 here, and there are there are so many things actually you can learn from that. That's why. Uh, I have a question. So uh, when you measure the new latency, how do you change the system to use the new number? <clears throat> okay, so right now we didn't change anything. Uh, so I, I didn't even you finish open sourcing this tool, so it's too early to say, but yeah, that's a good forward-looking forward question. I, I don't know if I have good answers right now. But I would imagine that others could also try this and uh, we could we could figure it out. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So we have like two minutes to go and a session recording is going to stop at that point. So if you want your question recorded, ask it now. <laughs> and then, yeah, there's, you like to them? Yeah, uh, it's something related. So you mentioned there's a, a pre-wake up uh, CPU timers. Um, then I'm not sure if uh, manual governor has already been fixed because there's a lot of heurist, uh, there's a, a few heuristics based on the uh, timer, so they can decide to enter C6 or not. So, uh, so if you have this feature, you can just uh, for any platform supporting this feature, we need to turn off this in, in the manual governor. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they are related. So in many governor, when you select the C state to enter, right, you, you know, it, it's a different thing. It's not C state latency. It's, it's the break even. It's, it's the, not your thing, but it's something that may, might need to be fixed in the manual governor because you have this feature. No, no I, I, no, I don't think they are related. In many governor, when you select the C state and you know you have to be in this C state at least, let's say, 200 microseconds for it to make sense to make, a, save any, any power. And you know the next interrupt is 100 microseconds away. It doesn't make sense to request this deep C state. You request more shallow. So okay. it's about br power break even. It's not about C state exit latency. It's, uh, it's Although, all, okay. It's all based on the estimation of future wake ups. Uh, but one of the input of how long it's going to wake up is actual timer expiration. So actually we don't need that uh, if you have already have this feature in hardware. Okay, yeah, we don't have time, I think, but he, I suggest to talk about this to Raphael. He knows everything about that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, in my personal opinion, these are not, these are kind of orthogonal things. Okay, so, so the short answer is this is a different timer. This is a different timer. It's not the timer he's using, it's a different timer. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about different, uh, maybe a different, uh, complicated Android. Uh, so totally independent of his work, but something uh, somewhat related. So okay, let's need talk about that later. Now we need to finish the session at this point. Uh, of course, we can continue the discussion. We have the room for the rest of the evening today, but the recording, as I said, is going to finish pretty much right now. So thanks a lot, everybody, for... Thank you. Uh, everything else is off the record, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so thanks a lot for, for participating and thanks a lot to the...